Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, I wanted to start by saying a big thank you to everyone who wished me a very happy holiday. I had last week off from doing live streams. So uh, I had a wonderful time, uh, really refreshed and I'm really uh, buzzing and, and uh, full of energy for season eight. So I've got a whole load of new ideas going on uh, that I'm really excited to pushing to be pushing forward with. But today is an open Q&A. As always, I've got some questions from my patrons. Uh, if there's any super chats, we'll get to them straight away and we'll pick up with as many different questions as we can from the chat. But I have got a very special guest today. Uh, it is the one and only, his infernal majesty, LML. LML, do you want to say hi? Robert, is that you? Are you, are you around? Hello? Rob? Oh, oh, there you are. Yes, hello. Hello, Robert. Thank you for having hello. me on today. An absolute delight, as always. I'm loving the hooded look. Um, it's, uh, it goes well with your background. It, uh, Lord, it's a very Lord of Darkness, you know, Hail Satan, that kind of thing. Uh, we don't endorse the take home Hail Satan game, but no. Sanry got it for me. Uh, I'm assembling my uh, something good for Con of Thrones. Let's just say that. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, okay, well, guys, as I said, we are probably going to be dotting about all over the place with some random questions. Uh, so just keep them coming. Uh, we will. Uh, keep going until we run out of questions or I run out of energy. I was uh, I only arrived back in the country this morning, so I'm feeling a little bit jet laggy, but we'll see how we go. Um, what happened? We did have buzzing a... with I thought you were buzzing with energy and stuff. What I happened? Am. My, my brain is buzzing with energy. My body is starting to subside, but I I've, I feel I've got enough to keep me going for a, for an hour or two. Certainly, we'll see how we uh, we get on with this one. Um, I just want to say, first of all, we did have a couple of uh, super chats just before we went live. So I want to uh, do a couple of quick thank yous uh, for them. Uh, Michelle Kalen, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I did get your questions over on Patreon, so uh, I will happily answer them. You don't have to apologize at all for doing two questions. Very happy to cover both of them. They were good questions. Um, and morally, uh, thank you for two very generous uh, super chats uh, saying uh, no questions, just a show of love and support for all you do. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And also to the mods. And I would back that up uh, completely. Uh, the moderators that I have on here, um, I haven't actually seen who's here today, but the moderators I have here uh, are fantastic and are wonderful ambassadors, not just just for this channel, but for the community as a whole, they work across uh, a large number of different uh, channels. So uh, guys, please do give a little bit of love uh, for the, the moderators um, uh, when they show their faces. I'm sure they are there, but I can't, can't see them immediately. Um, but let's get on straight away with, um, oh, Jack Hurst, thank you so much for the Super Chat. Best entrance ever, LML. Glad to have you back, Robert. Thank you. Uh, the best twosome in the community. Well, that's that's uh, very kind of you to say. Um, certainly, um, I would count uh, LML as uh, a fine contender for the best onesome in, in the community, and I'd be honored to be part of a twosome with him. Um, but let's, let's start with a question from Bonds over on Patreon. Uh, this is saying, did Aegon, the son of Rhaegar and Elias, survive the sack of King's Landing? Um, if he did, is this does this not make him the true Targaryen heir? Could this be Fagon or someone else? If someone else, who? Um, so I, I'll start by saying that this is a subject that I will be covering in a whole video uh, later on in my series on uh, Robert's Rebellion, the Tower of Joy. I'll probably pick up on that one just after the Tower of Joy because I'm getting really into the Tower of Joy stuff right now. Uh, but there is. Fagon, Aegon is going to be a whole video to itself. But I will start by getting LML's view on this. Did baby Aegon survive? My name is Fagon. I'm carrying the steel. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a whole Weezer, My Name is Fagon cover song, uh, which I have performed live, but I will spare your audience uh, the pain of that. You can find that on my Lucifer means Lightbringer YouTube channel on my happy birthday stream, if you're curious. But, you know, I was surprised, Robert, after I did my performance of My Name is Fagon, uh, I found out that there were a lot more Factagon truthers out there in the world than I imagined. And I used the word truther <laughs> very lightly and jokingly, of course. Uh, but yeah, no, a lot of people, um, or at least a few people, more than one or two, uh, think that he's real. 
And I think when you look at the evidence and you put it all together, I think the Blackfire parentage is is pretty solid, but it's not like RLJ solid to the point where, you know, it's indisputable. I, I do look forward to your breakdown. Um, I'm pretty sold on him as a Blackfire. So I consider the Fagon is is actually fact gone to be a pretty like, you know, remote or a little bit of a fringe theory. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Um, maybe uh, maybe there's something coming on. I, to me, Robert, the real question is, is he a piss water prince or is he a black fire? That to me is the interesting question. Well, yeah. So my what I might actually do is put him another um twitter poll up on this one actually well after i did my r plus l equals j video i put up a twitter poll just to take the temperature of the community to see where people are at and that came out for those who didn't see it at somewhere around 89 90 percent believing that john was uh reagan and Leanna's, uh child it was something about five or six percent i think for um uh, ned and ashara and then the rest were some other random theory um so uh, I think I might put up another little Twitter poll just to take the temperature of, of the, the community on there. I think I agree that there, I have come across a lot of people who uh, like the idea that this might well be Aegon who survived. And we should say that the, the reason why there's that doubt is that that baby's face was smashed in beyond recognition. So nobody could actually recognize that this definitely was um, uh, who they think it was. Now, um, where I go into my videos on this is I, I feel instinctively that he probably is, the, the character we know as Fagon probably is a Blackfire for a whole set of contextual evidence that uh, I'll go into in, in the video, but it fits in with this idea of where Illyria and Varys seem to be coming from and a huge plot going on there. Um, does that mean, therefore, that I think that probably that was baby Aegon who died? Yes, probably. But where it all ends up in terms of the story is that we have another character who theoretically has got a very strong claim to the Iron Throne, but in reality, it's a little bit murky. So in the books, we're going to end up with what we had time after time after time in Fire and Blood. Looking back through the history of House Targaryen, we're going to have a good old-fashioned Targaryen succession crisis. We're going to have first two and then three uh, people who each have some sort of potential claim. And it's really not, it boils down not to who actually is the rightful king or queen, but who has the power to back it up so that is that is the message that we've got from fire and blood again and again and i think i've probably said this on a live stream before but if you look at fire and blood the clear thing that happened again and again and again um was that uh, each generation the person who potentially could have inherited didn't because somebody else took it by force including people like jaharis um took it effectively took it by force because they were the strongest there and it wasn't necessarily who should have followed in some kind of purest line of succession so that's what we're going to get again in uh the winds of winter um dark mother thank you so much for the super chat uh six dollars and 66 the usual myth head um uh tribute to our dark lord who is is horned and beautiful as always um, so uh, let's move on to another question we've got uh, over on Patreon. As I said, we were going to move around quite a little bit here. This is about the Night King. So it's it's very much a show question, but I think we may well have some kind of crossover into the books. There will be some sort of crossover into the books, definitely. This is John Lamb who's saying, um, who will survive? I don't know. But how do you think the Night King can be stopped? By fire, dragon glass, valyrian steel, bran slash magic? Um, I don't think the ending will be cut and dried as we think. We will be left with more questions than answers, unfortunately. So I, the, I think the way I'll, I'll frame this question to you, LML, is that central question. It, taking the show law, how, whether this is the way it goes down or not, how could you, do you think, kill the night king well the first question 
that that the show is raising is the issue of dragon glass in the books dragon glass seems like a great way to kill the others and we've never seen a quote unquote night king other that's you know different but in the in the books or in the show rather they introduced an interesting paradox as soon as they showed us that night king was created with a piece of dragon glass because it's like wait a minute dragon glass usually kills white walkers and the children also used dragon glass to stop Benjen's process halfway through so that he didn't get fully under control of the White Walker magic, as he puts it. So it seems like Dragonglass is a, a little more complex than just it destroys all ice beings. It also created the first ice being. So I don't know that Dragonglass is going to kill the Night King. That, that almost wouldn't really make sense at this point. So he must be different than the other White Walkers, who I who obviously can die with Dragonglass, because we've seen Sam kill one with Dragonglass. So Valerian Steel might do it, maybe. Um, maybe it would wound him, but not just like melt him instantly. That's a possibility. Um, but I do think he'll have to be confronted on the astral plane, and most likely on the astral plane and the physical plane at the same time. So you're going to have John and Bran and everybody teaming up with with uh, Bran being the one who's inside the Weirwood net. That's what I'm talking about when I say the astral plane. I'm talking about the Weirwood net. We've already seen Night King and Bran confront each other on that plane. So all that's waiting for is for Bran to level up and to be able to compete with Night King on that on that level uh, while somebody uh, ties him up physically. We were talking about this on my channel recently um, when we were talking about the show, and we brought up the comparison of the Lord of the Rings finale where you have Sam and Frodo taking the ring to Gondor. They're on a magical mission at the same time as the armies are fighting Sauron, Sauron's armies. And so you have this dual confrontation. I suspect you'll have something like this in the show. Um, and as well as the whole astral plane, physical plane question, we've got this shot in the trailer that looks like John and Danny flying their dragons far to the north, north of the wall, potentially. That could be a Frodo and Sam-like mission to go to like the heart of winter and do some magical shit while the white Walker army is like marching South and destroying Westeros brands on the astral plane. Basically it's going to be a complex thing to take down night King. And then there's the question of some sort of pact or oath or non battle oriented solution too. So there's a lot, there's a lot in the air, as you can see a lot of plates spinning. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And I think it was interesting with the Lord of the Rings parallel. I'm, I'm love um talking about lord of the rings parallels uh i never saw the the frodo sam thing as being the equivalent of an astral plane or magical battle i saw that as being actually the the humble thing the thing you don't notice the thing which actually the ring is destroyed by accident it's not by some great power and it was actually the humble thing which destroyed this cause of great pride and power. So I think for me, if anything, that is the thing we should be looking out for is not this, the, that the, the, the Night King is destroyed by huge battle, but by something unexpected and something that perhaps we don't think of as powerful. Within the show, what th they've only given us a few clues, actually. One of them is obviously with the creation, which is, so he seemed to have had this dragon glass shard put in him. So putting another dragon glass shard in him doesn't, you know, even forcibly doesn't seem to make sense to me that that's the way to kill him. If anything, maybe taking it out might be the way to kill him. But the other kind of uh, sort of possible... Wait, wait are we going to get some magical surgery? Well, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm not ever. making. I'm not making predictions here. I'm just trying to say the the uh, the clues that they've given us so far. That would seem to be if you are just simply taking the information that they've given us in the show so far. How do you make the Night King? The answer appears to be some juju magic and putting a piece of dragon glass into his heart. How do you unmake it? Well, presumably juju magic and taking it back out again. That. That's the logic there. If, you, if you're purely taking what they've told us and shown us on the show, that is the way that you would unmake the Night King. Um, the the so other... Robert, no, go, go ahead. So that means that uh, Sam uh, healing Jorah 
was actually the foreshadowing for the end. We, we need the surgeon that was promised. And uh, <laughs> one thing that is interesting is the interview with the Night King actor recently, he let it, sl it let it slip that Night King did not want to be transformed and tied to that tree. That was against his will. And you could sort of see that in the clip. He didn't, he was like, rrr, rrr, and he didn't look happy, you know? So it's, it's a chance that he might want that thing out of there if somebody knew how to do it. I don't know. Yeah, so the the way that they've been building this up is that this is all about a big battle and you have to, the good guys have to defeat the bad guys. That is clearly, in my view, not how we're going to get the ending in the books. The books is not going to be about destroying the big bad evil and therefore the good guys live happily ever after. That's not where this story seems to be going. Now, the show is going to be slightly different, but... I hope that they retain that core element that the, the, the heart of the solution to this is not by fighting, it is by something else. So that's my hope. As I say, my, this, this idea of extracting the, the, the dragon glass from him is just based on pure logic, but on, given what we've been shown. Um, uh, but if you were to take the sort of the way that the show seems to be wanting us to go and get excited by, then fiery Valyrian steel sword that somehow has had uh, dragon glass used in its manufacture combines all the elements of things that the White Walkers seem to be allergic to into one amazing sword. So if you're wanting some sort of Lightbringer-esque thing, then a, a, a Valyrian steel sword on fire would be it. Um, uh, but yeah, so so that's a. I think it's a really good question. What I where, where I come from is I hope this isn't just a how do we kill the Night King. I hope that there's something more to it. Well, Robert, so consider this. Um, usually, uh, the goal before you can sign a pact, you have to battle to some sort of stalemate. Uh, and frequently, the end goal of war is to force a political agreement of some kind. And so that may be what you get. I mean, there will be some amount of big battle, obviously. But of course, it's not just going to be that. It may be that you've got to you've got to create a stalemate so that John and Night King can walk out there and hash out the terms and shake on it or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, do. yeah, exactly. So there will be. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. There will be a big battle. There will be lots of warfare going on. Uh, the the bit and and this is what I said when I was talking about the trailer. The bit that we have to remember is they showed us. I would estimate pretty much nothing of the last three episodes of Game of Thrones. We know nothing pretty much about that. Maybe there was a little shot here or there, but the trailer is, as far as I can tell, 95 plus percent footage from episodes one to three. So they have kept that last bit very, very hidden. And that and the big battle, as it were, that normally is the penultimate episode, is in, as far as we can understand it, episode three. That's not very spoilery. They've even said as much. Um, uh, so it seems as if there's a lot of action after the big battle. So that uh, that is what gives me hope, that they are going to be moving on from this idea of it just being about a big war. Robert, I think that's actually the, the most interesting thing we know about season three that there's going to be a conflict at Winterfell in the before ha before the halfway point essentially and that really like we have no idea what's coming after that because yeah. it's like will there be anything left of Winterfell what's going to happen i mean it's it's a really interesting thing to to demarcate that out and say it's going to happen in episode 3 and then we're going to have four more the longest four episodes of the last four yeah right yeah uh, almost feature length, so they're about eighty-ish minutes each as well. So, so there's a lot of stuff going on in those uh, those last four episodes, which is the equivalent of like you know, most of a season of normal Game of Thrones. And I want to move us on. This is fascinating stuff. I think we'll come back to the Night King in a bit, but we've got a few super chats I want to pick up on though. DC Wheaton the third, thank you so much for your super chat. Twenty dollars is very generous. Thank you. Uh, saying hi, guys. Long time lurker and finally able to catch one of these live. It's fantastic to have you on here. I love it when people uh, come on live for the first time in the in the the chat room. It's uh, a very different experience from watching it uh, later on. So uh, welcome. Uh, could Dark Sister have been imbued with some magic after the battle above the God's Eye? Um, this is uh, a battle which happened 
um, in the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, two dragons and two princes sacrificed at the heart of the Weirwood net. So yes, the 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 uh, well, I'll, I'll let LML actually do, give give us the, the detail of this. But what I what I will say though, just as a background, Dark Sister already had already was a magical blade. All Valyrian steel swords are magical. So what we're looking at here is not um, whether or not it became magical at that point. What we're looking at is whether potentially on the basis of how we understand Valyrian magic to work, which seems to be involved blood sacrifice, which seems to involve fire, both of which seem to have been there, um, uh, whether that might have somehow created some extra magic around Dark Sister. But LML, what, what, what do you think on this? I know that you're big into sort of how magic might work. What, what do you reckon? Yeah, this is a mechanisms of magic question. And shout out to the Between Two Weirwoods panel that we did with Robert and a couple other luminaries of the fandom. You can find that on my other YouTube channel, which is Between Two Weirwoods with a number two. In Great, any case, by the way. Good channel, oh, guys. Go go and check it out. Yes, well, it was right on topic. So, <laughs> uh, so this, it's a question of how magical mana works. For example, it's let's talk about Danny's funeral pyre. She hatches three dragons. We're told that only death can pay for life. So, were there three lives that paid for the three dragons? This is a very popular thought. You've got Miriamazdur on the pyre. You've got Drogo's dead body on the pyre. He died earlier that day. But it's like, all right, close enough. Well, the third life would be Rego, who actually died the night before. Uh, so the question is, like, how long does magical mana hang around? How does it accrue? Who's doing the math here and weighing the scales? We're not really sure. And George, of course, doesn't want these things to be very specific. So the idea that's being suggested by the question is, can, can a Valerian steel sword, which is already a magic sword, like you said, Robert, which was almost certainly created with blood magic and blood sacrifice. It's very strongly hinted that that's how you make Valerian steel. That's part of the spells is blood magic. And Marwyn tells us all Valerian magic's rooted in blood and fire. So that would kind of fit the pattern. So can Valerian steel swords accrue magical mana? That's the question. It seems possible. I, I would, if I had to bet, I would say, I mean... I don't know. I I'm, I'm tend to be skeptical on stuff like that, but I mean, we know that's kind of what Lightbringer is. Lightbringer is a human sacrifice that creates a magical sword, supposedly. And yeah, so yeah. Dark Sister being jammed into Aemon's, you know, blind eye with its blue star sapphire. I mean, it's symbolically very charged. Uh, and then it's happening right around the god's eye. I mean, yeah, it's not impossible. It definitely is remarkable like i said in terms of symbolism and the fact that that's the sword that's floating around is pretty exciting to me um i don't know i i don't know that that's really going to come into play like you're not going to see widow's whale not widow's whale i'm sorry dark sister light on fire and somebody's going to be like oh yeah that's because of that one time you know but george could be sort of softly showing us that sort of blood sacrifice to make a sword kind of an idea I tend to interpret that as more symbolism, I would say. I think I'd agree. I think the other thing that I would add to this is that the majority, probably even the vast majority of magic that we've seen, not all, but the vast majority of magic we've seen is intentional in some way. It may not exactly happen the way that people think, but people are trying to do magic and then magic happens. Uh, the obvious clear example is the first resurrection of Beric Dondarrion, which is uh, an exception to many things. But um, most of the time when magic happens, it's not just the, there's a confluence of stuff and then boom, a magical thing happens and nobody really knows where it came from. Um, it is somebody trying to do magic and there's no indication that people were trying to do magic at that point. So I think my gut instinct is probably no. I like the idea. Yes, there are lots of the ingredients there, but I don't think anyone was trying to do something. That said, it's a very magical place. There were some very magical people around there, probably both in Harren Hall and uh, on the Isle of Faces. So possibly, but whether or not we'll actually see that played out, I'm not so sure. So uh, Robert, can I actually take two minutes and explain what is really awesome about that scene? Because I think it, it does I, foreshadow the, the sort of last battle, if you will. I would love you to. 
Okay, so on one side, you've got Damon Targaryen, the rogue prince. His dragon is Caraxes, the blood worm. Caraxes is a red dragon. Um, opposed to him is Aemond One-Eye, who's replaced his blind eye with a blue star sapphire. It's very others-like. Uh, reminds you of Euron a little bit, or Waymar from the prologue, who had one eye stabbed out and ended up with one blue star eye. And he's riding Vagar. And Vagar, we don't know the coloring of. George has never said. Although Vagar is described as a hoary old bitch in this scene. And the word hoary it can just mean old, but a lot of times it means white with age or snowy white, frosty white with age. There are some sort of snowy implications of the word. And it's used to describe other dragons as well. So you can't put too much on it. But point being, think about the ice dragon constellation, Robert. It's said to either, there's a, the North Star in Westeros is a blue star, and it's supposedly either the eye of the ice dragon or the eye of the rider of the ice dragon. We, we hear both folk tales. And so you have this constellation, the ice dragon, the rider has a blue star eye. Well, look at Vagar. Vagar is a dragon, a hoary old dragon, whose rider has a blue star eye. So that to me is George showing us on one side, the ice dragon symbolic of team others if you will and on the other side we have a red dragon and a guy with a black valyrian steel sword which to me sounds a lot like a lightbringer type of thing and so you get this battle fire versus ice to me in the air they both kill each other and they both fall into the lake and so it's very poetic as far as song of ice and fire battling canceling each other out and then they both have this very symbolic death and then backing up right before the battle You've also got Daemon Targaryen in the Godswood at Harrenhal, leaving 13 slashes on the Weirwood tree as he counts the days until Aemon shows up. And so that number 13 is very suggestive of the last hero and his 12 companions, which again is, they're the people that oppose the others. So you've got Daemon and the Red Dragon with a sort of last hero symbolism versus this guy with the blue star eye. Uh, it's it's he's he's got other night kings so he's got night black armor Aemond one eye does so he's basically a night king on the ice dragon so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we do get Danny or John on a dragon bat you know against the Night's King on an ice dragon like serious dragon versus dragon in the air and we'll look back at that God's eye battle as a bit of foreshadowing for the end so that's what I got to say on that one. I, I think that's a fabulous point. And also in terms of the symbolism of 13, 13, obviously the Knight's King in the legends in the book was the 13th Lord Commander of the Knight's Watch. So that is very much a symbolic number associated with him. And I think, um, I'm just going to very quickly, uh, Christy Miller, thank you so much for your, for your super chat, $10 saying keep up the good work. Uh, but this links in with um, a question, if I can find it, um, uh, from, I think, I think it was from Jack Hurst, actually, um, saying, hope you had a nice break, Robert. I did. Thank you so much. Um, yesterday, I was explaining to my friend, show only, why you think all the dragons will die. And he thought there's no way they'd kill all of them. Do you think it's likely in the show they'll kill all the dragons or bow to fan service and allow a survivor? And I think this ties in clearly here because this idea of balance is where I come from on this, which is... Uh, what you were trying to show there is you get this ice and fire, they destroy each other effectively in this kind of foreshadowing that we have here. And where I have said in the past, I've never, I think, categorically said that I think all the dragons will definitely die. What I think we are going to have is a situation where there will be balance between ice and fire. And I do not, this is after the end of it all, and I do not think that that would be achieved by having one or more live fiery dragons and a vanquished um, uh, Night King or White, War uh, White Walkers or others or whatever. So that probably means that the dragons will, I, will probably die or somehow recede and pass away. Now, it's entirely possible that we could end up with somebody flying off on a dragon so the dragons are not there and, and ice, uh, uh, the, the others are not there. But that's where I kind of see that, um, that balance coming in. Uh, so not, I think some of the dragons will definitely die. Uh, all of them may well die, but I think the key is this balance that you're talking about. Where, where are you on that one, um, 
in terms of the the dragons, whether the dragons will survive. Do you think there's any kind of uh, uh, symbolism attached to this in some way? Well, I, th I think you just hit it right on the head. There has to be balance. So if the dragons, if there's any dragons surviving, that means that there is a Night King or some others surviving too. Um, so it's either going to be both or neither. I think you very well, I couldn't have put it better myself. I mean, there has to be, you won't get a total victory for one or the other. That's just, that's just not good. Not in the cards. I tend to think, I don't know, Robert, I'm actually pretty divided on this because I do think that Robert, uh, that George is going to give us an ending um, that is ambiguous where like we might, see the whole thing end but then we're like oh man the others are probably going to come again in another eight thousand years and this whole thing isn't even over so you might get a hint like we might have dragon eggs and then a hint that we didn't quite defeat the others or you'll get a total wipeout of others and dragons and the world will just be less magical afterwards but i think either one would be interesting and i could see george doing either one um between those two what what seems more likely to you no magic or like a hint that the whole cycle will start again that it's only been pacified i mean a, a bit of both is is where i would go with i think that in any event the idea that there is no fire magic i think certainly in the books that's not going to happen because we've got all of what whatever we've got an old valeria we've no idea what's what's going on uh, beyond a shy rumors potentially there are dragons there so i think we're going to be left in a situation where the threat from ice and fire destroying the world has gone, but people are very aware that it could come back. Either or both could come back, which I think means that we're not going to see completely the end of the others. I see more, I think it's entirely possible that they will go back like they did last time in whatever way that happened. And uh, that it's just, uh, okay, so we now get a chance to build things up, but I, I, I agree with you kind of visually. I, I think the show probably would love this idea of something as a last or penultimate shot hinting that, oh, there's some more dragon eggs over here. Or, ah, oh, we didn't show you, but there's some more others, white walkers hidden up here. Just so you think that actually there is the potential for the whole thing to happen again in another 8,000 years. You could see some wildling north of the wall leaving a male baby in front of a weirwood and you can see some icy mist begin to swirl and then the screen cuts <laughs> yeah there are so many different ways they could do this it's, it's just uh, uh, if they just want a little hint that there's something else there it's it's the kind of thing you know we all try and get into the into the minds of the showrunners but it's the kind of visual stuff that they love doing so uh, yeah it wouldn't surprise me at all anime lover nicole thank you so much for your super chat uh, saying, I love your collars. I think that's meant to be collabs rather than collars with Gemma. Uh, where do you think the two Targ swords are? Will they show up in the show? Uh, have a nice stream and good night. Well, good night to you. I hope you catch this uh, when you wake up. In terms of the two Targaryen swords, um, slightly different answers on books and show. I did a video on this ages ago where uh, I think it was called something like Where Are Blackfire and Dark Sister? A Blackfire in the books, I am pretty sure, is currently in the possession of Illyria Mapatis. I think that he is going to try and give it to Fagon, Aegon, who we were talking about earlier, as this symbol of his inheritance that they're trying to show, to bolster his claim to show that he is the rightful heir, because Blackfire was the historic sword of the Targaryen kings. I think that's where that is. Um, in the show, they've not really mentioned this at all. I have a feeling that we might just see, like they gave us little nods to some other things, like they gave a nod to Dawn, the sword. They gave a nod to the, what looked like the Horn of Winter in that cache of dragon glass. Uh, I wonder whether they might give a nod to it with the Golden Company, perhaps, but it's not going to be a major thing, I'm pretty sure, in on the show, because they've not really mentioned it thus far. In terms of Dark Sister, we've had confirmation um, from uh, one of the fine members of our own community. I think it was Ashaya who asked George R. R. Martin uh, and got confirmation from him relatively recently that Dark Sister went up with uh, Blood Raven to the wall. 
he, it's not at the wall, so he almost certainly took it with him when he went up to uh, the cave. I think that's where it is right now. Um, I think that on the show, they had this kind of, again, a kind of a lingering look at Mira grabbing a sword as she was leaving the cave. I think that that is a nod to the fact that whenever Bran comes back south again, as I think he surely will in the books, uh, perhaps not in exactly the same way, uh, but when he does come south with him, he and Mira, assuming Mira comes with him, will bring Dark Sister with him. I don't think they're going to make a thing of it on the show, I'm afraid. So that's where I think they are. Uh, LML, have you got any other great thoughts on where these things might be? Yes, and a couple of mediocre thoughts, and I'll mix them all together. <laughs> you can't tell, like a nice... Yes, just like you do usually. Like, uh, <laughs> with, like, like a bowl of brown, if you will. Uh, no. Um, you know, one time, uh, Robert, we added up all the Valerian steel weapons that we know are in that are available and in people's hands, including like a Valerian steel ax that somebody has. And we got exactly to 13, um, just saying. So there's a chance we'll need all the swords for a new, like last heroes Baker's dozen, if you will. Um, this that, is in that the would, books you mean? Uh, yeah, I'm talking in the books, but you could see something similar in the show is what I was getting around to saying, because we got Gendry forge and stuff. We've got, you know, the fact that Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper are going to be in the same place with Gendry and Winterfell. Um, there's a potential that you could see ice reforged or it could be Gendry just forging regular weapons or dragon glass weapons. But I mean, the show plays fast and loose. They could just have, grind up dragon glass and put it in some new swords and be like, these are other killing swords or something. So I, I do think that the swords... We could see some stuff with a lot of swords or even a lot of flaming swords. Um, you know, I think anything like that is possible in either one. But to go back to Blackfire and Dark Sister, which is what the question was about. Um, so, yeah, you covered the basics. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, in my song, my name is Fagon. I've, I wrote a <laughs> second uh, verse about uh, John Con where it says, my name is John Con. Got a box full of court clothes and a big sword Valerian. So I, I even got that in the lyrics because he's inside those boxes of clothes. He's got a big Valerian sword called Blackfire. So that's that's yeah. coming. Here's what I think is interesting, Robert. You've got Blackfire and Dark Sister, these swords that are like paired together, but one's a little bigger than the other. And then we have Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, similar setup where one sword is bigger than the other. I just love that parallel. And I would love to see all four of those swords out there you know make a noise if you will so i don't know what to yeah. say about it it's cool no i i agree i think that so in the show i think that they are basically just at the level of valyrian steel swords are cool and they can kill white walkers and so we've got this cast of characters now who are assembled up at the wall each of whom have got some kind of valyrian steel weapon that they can use so John has got one, Aya's got one, uh, Jamie's got one, Brienne's got one. And so so I think that that's the world that we're in. It's just that these are the people who can kill White Walkers. Um, just to pick up on the reforging of ice issue, because uh, I've heard a few people mention this around and about over the last few weeks. Um, I love it symbolically. Uh, in practical terms, prior to the war, the idea of taking two perfectly serviceable and useful swords and turning them into one sword that isn't a sword fit for battle because it's a massively long ceremonial sword strikes me as being a little bit silly. Uh, so uh, pure practical terms, I think that if they reforge ice, it has to be afterwards, unless they've got some particular reason for thinking that ice in itself has got a, some great magic to it. Um, I think the value of having two workable swords rather than one not really workable sword suggests to me that they should keep them as they are. I just, I just love your approach to this, Robert. It's so funny. It's just, it, it couldn't be any more on brand for you. It's, it's not very practical to have one big sword when you could have two swords. I'm sorry, it's a terrible Robert uh, impression, but I thought no, it was an Australian impression. I, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure what you're doing. Anyway, so far off the mark, it might as well have been. Uh, let's just forget it ever happened. But in all seriousness, <laughs> um, the only reason to reforge ice would be to make a new Lightbringer. 
Uh, it would be for some magical or ceremonial type of thing. You're right, it's way better to have two separate swords to fight the others with. But we've got Sam and Bran ruffling around in history and in these books and looking for information about how to beat the others. Um, the the wow. emotional impact, think about it this way. Think about what looks good on TV, Robert. Think about manipulating the audience's emotions with symbols, reforging ice for John to wield against the Night King. Everyone's going to like that. There's nothing silly they, or wrong. They, they, that. They, I, I, I accept that. I'm merely going with the practical side, and, and I can't believe I'm the first It'll person on this on live fire. stream to say that. But surely if they were wishing to have Lightbringer, they would, they would go for a, a sword forged from a moon meteor, which, as we all know, is the ultimate form of magic. Well, all Valerian steel swords were made out of meteorite, or that's the secret ingredient, didn't you know? <laughs> I I go with the 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 finest sword of them all, Dawn, which is clearly the key to ending. Well, no, the, in, the all, in all seriousness, uh, they the Valerians made contact with Gagasos uh, way back in the very earliest part of their civilization, and Gagasos is right next to the Isle of Toads, which has a huge oily black stone frog, forty feet tall, and it's right downstream from Yin, where you have a bunch more oily black stone. And I don't think all the or the black stone is meteorite stone, but I do think it's connected to the meteorite stone. And so there's actually, I mean, it's total tinfoil, don't get me wrong, but there's, it, there's a little thread of like Valerians going to Gagasos to mine oily stone. And that's why nobody can make Valerian steel because there's a secret ingredient and it's meteorite ore. But that being said, the meteorite stuff is, a, is mostly symbolism. You know, I mean, you don't have to have that. I think the important thing is that ice is emotionally the most important sword. It's the one we saw Ned sitting in the godswood with when the whole story began. So if we can put ice back together, and if it can become a flaming sword, then it would be ice and fire. It would be Ned's sword. I just To me, that's by far the most emotionally resonant thing you can do with swords in the, in the end of the story. Well, well per perhaps we will end it there with this discussion of the uh, emotionally emotionally resonant swords or swords that can actually kill things. Uh, you decide which is more useful. Um, uh, shout, out, shout out to Joe Magician <laughs> in the chat, who's um, riffing on the oh, same idea on his Twitter feed about ice. Oh, his, is he? Well, well, I would never disagree with Joe, who is uh, far more knowledgeable and wonderful than either of us. Uh, it has to be said. Uh, well. Certainly me. I, I, LML may well give him a, a run for his money. Uh, Merit of Abydos, thank you so much. 22 euros, that's very kind. No question, only to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, that's lovely. Um, uh, the, we've got quite a few uh, super chats. So let's uh, see if we can get through a few more of them. Uh, Aaron Pete um, saying, did the children get a magic power downgrade as the weirwoods were destroyed? It would explain some of their larger magic in the past and the lack now. So, yeah, so this is another, and I'll, I'll throw this one to you again, um, LML, because this is a mechanisms of magic thing. Is the power of the, uh, the children's magic, is it related to the number of weirwoods or the strength of the sacrifice or some combination of the two? What do you think? Probably lean towards the latter. Um, meaning that we know for a fact that the whole death pays for life is the is the backbone principle of most magic. Blood magic seems to be the thing that's sort of unites all the different kinds of magic, whether it's ice or fire or squishers or whatever else. You see this common thread of magic isn't free. It's got a very heavy cost. Martin is very interested in the cost of magic. The cost of magic is usually sacrifice death blood there's a lot of power in blood and a lot of sort of pagan reliefs not pagan i guess that's an antiquated word but a lot of animistic religions believe that you know there's literal power in death and in people's life essence and in sacrifice and stuff so that's that's the operative thing however i do think cutting down the weirwoods um hurts the children of the forest it makes the weirwood net weaker uh, and if they were all to be rooted out, then you you wouldn't have a weirwood net. So yeah, that the first part is important too, the presence of the actual weirwoods. And I love the pando theory that like all the weirwood 
roots are connected underground basically through the whole continent and westeros is essentially a living continent yeah so i think that's that's i think quite an important point so the weirwoods are both a sort of a, a gathering of the knowledge and experiences of of those whose essence has gone into them and also an expression of the living continent because the weirwood roots as far as we can tell go right underneath the continent and cover it all so that the magic of the children of the forest isn't just the same as other kinds of magic uh, this seems to be the magic of the the earth itself the the the, the continent this is this is westeros's magic um, if that's not too uh, highfalutin um uh, Linda Prasuta, thank you so much. Fifty dollars is very generous. Thank you so much. Um, do you think we'll see Sam the Magician perform dark magic? Wow. Um, so this is uh, this comes from the idea that that Sam um, he has once said, you know, I always wanted to be a magician, um, and clearly he's deep into the learning. And if anyone can figure out how to do this kind of magic, then Perhaps Sam can figure out. Certainly, he's uh, joined up in the books with uh, the Marwin's gang, Marwin the Mage, the Maester who does magic. He's uh, sort of found himself in in that group of people. So it's entirely possible that he may start being able to do some kinds of magic, particularly around, say, glass candles, things like that. The question whether he's going to do dark magic is an interesting one because that implies that there are you know, light magic and dark magic. I don't necessarily buy into this idea that there is like sort of good magic and bad magic uh, within George R. R. Martin's world. Um, but uh, yeah, I could certainly see him do some, but in terms of who's the big mage, that's Bran. Uh, but LML, what do you think? Are there... Um, are there any bits of sort of symbolism around Sam, other than this kind of it makes sense and he sort of talked about it in the past, are there bits of symbolism connecting Sam with doing magic? Yes. Um, Sam has a ton of connections to Sir Nunos and the Horned Lord and all of that sort of green man type of folklore. So he, his house, House Tarly, was founded by these twins, Herndon of the Hunt, Herndon the Hunter and Harlan of the Horn. Um, no, Herndon of the Horn and Harlan the Hunter. It's basically George smashing up the legends of the Harlequin with Hearn the Hunter. And Hearn the Hunter is an English folktale uh, about a undead sort of stag man. He's got the antlers on his head. He rides a horse and he protects the woods. He's the leader of the wild hunt, some other stuff like that. And essentially, um, George has woven that mythology into House Tarly pretty heavily. And then you have Sam being the one to encounter Cold Hands, who in the show, that's that's Benjen, Undead Benjen in the book. It's a guy named Cold Hands, and he rides an elk instead of a horse. And the, of course, that's a bit of green man lore. The green men were said to ride elks. So there's this connection that Sam has with stag men and all that mythology pretty much through his whole thing. And uh, the Horned Lord is heavily associated with magic. I mean, it, which modern pagan witchcraft is all about the Horned Lord and the Triple Goddess. Those are their chief deities. Um, and even in the Song of Ice and Fire, the Horned Lord, quote unquote, is associated with magic. There's a wildling king beyond the wall called the Horned Lord, and he was said to pass the wall with magic. And he's also the one that authored the saying, sorcery is a sword without a hilt. There's no safe way to grasp it. That was from the Horned Lord. And oh, by the way, that quote basically ties back into what you were saying. As far as good and bad magic, there is no good magic. There is no light magic. It's all swords without hilt. It's all dangerous. It's all very costly. I mean, I was trying to think of an example of good magic in A Song of Ice and Fire. And I mean, it, it all has a price. You know, I mean, the closest thing you can get is like the skin changer and the wolf bond. But there's still sort of an invasive thing about taking over the wolf's consciousness, because when it's done to a human, we see that the human hates it. And also we see that when Vermeer takes the shadow cat or the snow bear, snow bear, those animals hate it and they resist him. So I guess you could make an argument that the, the wolf 
human skin changer bond is isn't overtly evil but most of it is pretty dark man so that's what yeah. i got to say and, and i think that the, when you're talking about the price where that's another way of what we were talking about earlier this theme of balance is that if you we see it specifically in this idea of when danny hatches the dragons is you get three deaths leading to three lives but every time magic is done there is a cost and it's like you have this balance you have to maintain if you break the laws of the universe through magic then there has to be something to balance that off in some way and that is quite often sacrifice so you gain something you lose something else and so uh, i guess you could argue that the the bad magic is when you the the cost is something that you've extracted from someone else and maybe i don't know whether the good magic therefore does that make something where you take the cost on yourself or is that simply just um, uh, just people who are, can't find somebody to, to or some some way to sort of uh, offload the the cost of it? I don't know. I think that the whole point is that George R. R. Martin is leaving this open to our interpretation um, and not deliberately not wanting to have good and bad, light and dark magic. So that does actually remind me of an interesting point. Um, the Lightbringer legend has Azor High stabbing his wife to make a flaming sword, which is pretty twisted. And I argue that it's one of the big clues that Azor Ahai was actually more of a villain than a hero. Uh, and that real heroes don't stab other people to make magic swords. We're not gonna see John stab Danny with a magic sword. I think it's interesting to contrast that with what we see with Beric. In both the show and the books, Beric lights his own sword on fire with his own magical blood and doesn't need to kill anybody else in order to do that. And so to me, that's really interesting. And it's kind of like, as soon as I saw that in the Storm of Swords, I was like, wait a minute. You don't need to stab someone to light a flaming sword on fire. You can do it yourself. And John is a resurrected fire white, quote unquote, for lack of a better terms, um, in, in some sense, uh, in both show and books, as far as at least, I guess in books, we have to say it's, it's foreshadowed, you know, that obviously he's going to be resurrected probably Melisandre will be involved. George has said that he put Beric in the story as a foreshadowing for John, and then he used the term fire white kind of right in there. So you get the feeling that John should be able to light his own sword on fire himself and won't need to stab somebody to do it. I just want to point that out. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point as well. And I, I said earlier on a tangent about something else uh, that... Beric's resurrection is, is an exception um, uh, to many of these rules that we come up with. And Beric himself is an exception to him. Um, the, the, the other times when he gets resurrected, the price, because that's not just a thing that just, poof, it happened, it's okay. The price seems to be the cost of something within Beric. He loses something. He, he loses the memory of the woman that he loved. He loses the taste of food that he enjoys, things like that. He loses a thing each time. Um, but it's within himself, not just, uh, you know, you're killing another thing in order to gain the balance right. So he, he is, in many ways, the most self-sacrificial character that we have got within this, certainly in terms of sort of the magical universe. Uh, so Beric is an, an understudied, if that's the word, uh, character, I think, in A Song of Ice and Fire in terms of what this might mean for how magic works and, as you said, LML, what this might mean in terms of the clear foreshadowing that he is for John. I'm so, you, I'm so glad you mentioned the critical understudiment of Beric because I have something to say about Beric if you care to hear it. I would I would just very quickly to say, Dark Mother, thank you so much for the super chat saying, for the pleasure of hearing LML riff. Uh, absolutely. It's always a pleasure. And let's let him do that now. So go on. Uh, talk, talk to us about Beric. So Beric is one of the most symbolically loaded people in A Song of Ice and Fire. The most obvious parallels that he has is to Blood Raven and to the actual legend of Azor High. So first of all, we see him with a flaming sword. And anybody with a flaming sword has to make us think of Azor Ahai. Furthermore, he's he's undead and transformed. And there's a lot of language about Azor Ahai defeating death and all those that die fighting in his cause will be reborn and stuff like that. Um, then he's 
he's um he's running on fire magic relor power if you will uh and we know that relor is uh relorism is the religion that preaches about azor Ahai and considers him to be their prophesied savior so that all checks out uh but he, the thing is he's also got one eye which by the way is described as a burning red eye he sits in essentially a weirwood throne in a cave full of weirwood roots and although he isn't a green seer he it, when we see him in the books, he's introduced as sitting up high in a nest of, of weirwood roots, and he sort of walks down as he gives this dramatic speech. So that's very like Blood Raven, who's another quote unquote corpse lord. They're both called corpse lords, and they both sit in a weirwood nest in a weirwood cave with one red eye, and they both have extended lifespans. Okay. <clears throat> then you have uh, Beric, in addition to his sword being a flaming sword, it also breaks when he fights against the hound. And George even describes the hound sword as, quote unquote, the cold one twice in that fight. So you have this idea of a cold sword and a flaming sword. And who do we know that had a broken sword, Robert? Um, uh, Isildur. Uh, well, yes, Isildur, that's true. But the, uh, the Song of Ice and Fire echo of Isildur would be the last hero whose first sword broke against the others. Only then later he appeared with dragon steel and he kicked the other's ass or whatever. So the broken sword motif, which George definitely took from Lord of the Rings, uh, is, is an important part of the Lightbringer last hero mythos. So Beric has both a flaming sword and a broken sword. And when you go back in the history of House Dondarrion, Robert, you get this story about the first Dondarrion being a page for the Baratheons, and he was against two foes, and his horse, um, this guy had his leg broken out from under him, and he was facing certain death, and then his sword broke, just like Beric's sword, and then lightning struck a tree and killed the two people uh, that he was fighting against, and that's why they have the thunderbolt on their sigil. And of course, the lightning striking the tree is is myth you know symbolism it's really important because of the gray king and the thunderbolt and the fire of the gods and all that stuff so Beric is this amalgamation to sort of sum it up of azor high stuff and green seer stuff and that's really interesting and very suggestive that azor high had some sort of involvement with the weirwoods and the green seers and then oh look blood raven himself is a blood of the dragon person who brought a valerian steel sword with him into the cave so there's a lot more to say about this, but it's very suggestive, as you can see. Yeah, um, I I would agree with all of that. I think that one other just random thing on Beric is that there's a scene that at some point I'm going to look at properly. It's the scene that you're talking about when you get Sandor and you get uh, Beric and they're fighting and you actually suddenly get in this moment when you get... Um, uh, this character who's got this very, he's sitting in his weirwood throne, and then he's there uh, fighting uh, for R'hllor in a, a rite of the Faith of the Seven. And it's like you've got these three different uh, faith systems in one. I'm just looking to see whether or not there's actually any kind of water magic going on there as well that I didn't spot the, the, the last time I read it, because the, he seems to be the focus of different types of magic. Um, but just on the Isildur thing, for those who are uh, unaware, so Isildur is the character right back, if you think about the Lord of the Rings films, right back at the beginning in the early days of Sauron when he strikes off the, the ring off of Sauron's finger and the sword breaks. Aragorn is his many, many, many times uh, sort of descendant. Um, and Aragorn has this kind of Azor high feel to him. He is the prince that was promised, effectively. There are, there are poems about him coming into his own and all the rest of it and reforging the sword and all the rest of it. So, uh, so that's the kind of imagery that George R. R. Martin has been playing with in this, as well as it's, it's, it's not just in Lord of the Rings. It's, it's, quite, it's in a lot of different tales, but that's, there's a very clear link across to there. And so before you try to move on, because I never like to let you move on, uh, consider Jon Snow now, Robert. He is part blood of the dragon. He also has gr uh, green seer slash skin changer blood in him. He has the one eye wound because of the eagle. It didn't take out his eye, but it left him a scar across one eye. And, and when, in the scene, he's temporarily blind and bloody in that eye, which gives him the Odin symbolism that both Beric and Bloodraven have. So, and a red, one red eye. And he's got... 
Uh, right, exactly. The one bloody eye. And so then he's got the dream of having a flaming sword, and he's obviously set up to be the new last hero, or one of the new last hero Zora High Reborn figures. So you can see by comparing John, Bloodraven, and Beric what George is getting at. He's, he's showing us a combination of Green Seer magic and Azor High stuff, uh, to, to put it in a very general sense. Yeah, and um, but I will move us on after this one. But just just as we're going on the sort of the That's John Beric things, um, the because it comes up a lot of times, uh, I and I think uh, LML is is in agreement with me on this. When John is brought back, it is not just going to be in, with this kind of fire magic, the Melisandre fire magic that will be involved. But I suspect that he will have walked into or walked into ghost and therefore he will have been saved and brought back by a combination of kind of the green seer magic and fire magic so he's he will indeed be a fire white but he also be uh, kind of a fire skin changey white we, we have to come up with new new words for these things but his his entire essence and reason for him being still alive alive is both bits of magic, not just the one, which kind of again underlines, of course, the fact that he has got this um, uh, heritage of ice and fire. But I am moving on, but quickly before LML uh, goes off into uh, another tangent, because I blame him for all of the tangents, never me, obviously. Uh, Donna Daly, thank you so much. Uh, 10 pounds, that's very kind. Uh, not a fully formed thought, uh, but the High Towers is a house that is as old as the Long Night. Uh, older, in fact. Uh, they also have a hand in forming the maesters. Could it end with ice and fire magic fighting the mundane? Um, this is a really interesting question. So uh, I very recently did a video on uh, the High Towers um, with Gemma. We were just talking about the family. And this, um, it clearly very quickly came apparent that they are the most underreported very important house in both books and show. Um, they uh, are older than even, say, House Stark by quite a considerable time. They moved into where the High Tower is. They built and brought down four different towers before the time of Bran the Builder, who was the founder of House Stark, apparently, so they're ancient. They were there. They set up the maesters. Uh, they were there um, central to setting up or to establishing the home of the Faith of the Seven in Old Town in their place. Old Town itself is the, the biggest, uh, was the biggest city almost all the way through the history of the continent. Um, they uh, are intermarrying with people all over the place. Uh, they are incredibly rich. We're told that they are as rich as the Lannisters, they have got the largest army within the largest army, the Army of the Reach in all of Westeros. They are stupidly powerful, and yet we hardly see them at all. So they are that they will have a big role to play in uh, what happens. Certainly in the books, I think on the show they've not really talked about them huge amounts, but in the books and actually slight tease. Uh, but I've had Eve, uh, I've had some more thoughts about the High Towers since I did that recording with Gemma. So I will probably and what they might be up to. Uh, so I will probably expand on that and uh, at some point in the video as well. But LML, just on this um, idea about the the maesters, just taking the High Towers and their maesters link, um, are we looking at the forces effectively the forces of magic, ice, and fire? battling against the forces of, uh, Donna says, the mundane. I'm thinking this being like humanity, the sciences, the maesters. Do you think that's the kind of battle we're going to end up with? I think that is one of the gears in the clock. If the clock is made up of like several gears, that's one of the struggles that's definitely going on. George is interested in that uh, whole concept, sort of a little more in the background, uh, but the, it is there. I mean, the maesters are everywhere. You get Lewin's commentary about magic right in the first book when he's talking to Bran. Um, and if we go towards an ending where magic either goes away altogether or recedes, then we're left with a more science-based world. One of the, you know, when you think of a dream for a spring or a hope for a better future, 
it would be nice if Westeros had a little bit of advancement or if maybe the seasons ended up regular again after all this is done so that they could have a more consistent agricultural society, maybe get out of the dark ages and stuff, you know, mix it up a little. Um, I mean, they're kind of backwards when you compare them to the more advanced places in Essos and the rest of the world. So I, I you know, it's fun to root for all the magic, but Robert, when you stick yourself in the world of Westeros, do you want a king with a dragon or not? Probably not, right? Like, you kind of have to say that the Maester's concept of like magic is dangerous and should be contained or shunned in that world, like they have a decent argument. Oh, well, I, I agree that they do. Uh, I think the way that they go about doing it, perhaps by keeping all the knowledge to themselves, et cetera, et cetera, is probably the wrong way of going about it. But I can entirely understand the the fact that they might see dragons and think, you know what, this is not good for the future of humanity, having these dragons around. I entirely get that. Um, just in terms of, to answer that question, uh, will it be magic against non-magic? I think, yes, I kind of like that idea. I think it's more like, uh, I always come back to the Robert Frost poem about, uh, about fire and ice. This is about fire and ice going against each other and what is in the middle getting caught up in it all is humanity. And so I think that is what we're looking at here is that humanity and the uh, the, the, the sciences and the, the maesters as part of it. I don't, I don't want to portray the maesters as the heroes of this in any way, shape or form, but I think that humanity is going to be in between these two forces which each in and of themselves could destroy the world. And so it is whether or not humanity can survive those two forces battling is going to be the issue. Um, had a couple of things I just spotted in, in the chat uh, from a couple of uh, wonderful people out there. Joe Magician saying, why does Robert hate my beautiful tinfoil? Uh, Matt, um, this, this was uh, to do with the reforging of ice. Um, uh, Matt, you know I love your beautiful tinfoil. Um, well, so it looks like Joe just put out a new video about that. I didn't even realize that when we were talking about that. So guys, go check out the Joe Magician YouTube channel. He's got a, I can't, I'm going to watch it like as soon as the stream is over. I can't wait. Well, he's also got another video he put out with uh, Amanda, the Disputed Lands, uh, who sometimes of this channel, I'm trying my best to get her back on there. If she does pop up in the chat, can people please tell her to come back on this channel because I'm trying desperately to get her back on. Uh, they did one on how strong that uh, that uh, is fantastic. I read through the script before it went out actually because I did a few of their, their audio narrations for the quotes from the book that they were using. And so I would highly recommend you go over to Joe's channel for that. And we also have uh, Baal the Bard, um, uh, who's suggesting, what about John wielding Oathkeeper in one hand and Widow's Whale in the other? I think that is clearly the best idea that we've had so far. Uh, it, it, it would look very cool. Um, uh, well, I do at least, I do at least, of course, have Phone <laughs> Keeper. Um, so I've got I've got one half of that. Um, and also I'd just like to add that uh, Crow Food's daughter and uh, Joe Magician are having a live stream tomorrow, uh, which I Robert, am. you're going to be on too, I think. So you should know about this. Well, what right? I've said to you, you've, you've blown my cover. Joe, Joe uh, just to helpfully put out that with possible surprise guest, what I said to Joe was that as I have literally just uh, flown back into the country today and didn't get any sleep on the flight, it really depends on whether or not I fall asleep beforehand. So uh, that was me sticking uh, my foot in my mouth. Uh, so I, sorry. Was, I was I was hoping to keep that level of detail away from everyone, but uh, if if I can possibly make it, then yes, I will jump in. Uh, if I can't, then uh, my apologies. I would highly recommend you go and check out that live stream anyway because they are two excellent creators. Um. Uh, let's, uh, we did have, uh, as always, another couple of uh, super chats. Uh, Donald Peoples, super random, but what happened to old Nan after Theon and the Boltons took Winterfell? Uh, it's always a pleasure when you two get together, by the way. So it is always a pleasure when uh, I get together with LML. Uh, in terms of what happened with, uh, thank you for the super chat, in terms of what happened to old Nan, um, uh, I think that she was taken, as were many others, in a big pile of them off to the Dreadfort. And from memory, Theon thinks about her and goes, ah, oh, well, she's probably dead by now because she was quite old. So that's the last we've heard of her in the books. 
Um, unless Alamo, you Robert, can contradict you just, me and you're tell just gonna, me that that's not true. You're just going to give it to people like them. I mean, not even going to soften it. Like she's probably dead. I mean, gosh, man, I hope you're never like a doctor or somebody I have to tell people their loved ones. She had a good innings. Come on. She, she, she did all right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, she probably is dead, but Hey, who knows? Uh, maybe she'll have come up with a little cameo later on in the last two books. We do not oh, know. I'm not quite not dead. I'm, I'm not quite dead. <laughs> is that your Australian accent again? <laughs> no, it's my Monty Python old lady accent. Oh, okay, fantastic! Uh, you're you're We've got killing spam, it. Spam, spam, egg, baked beans, spam, egg and more spam. Um, I honestly don't know what to do with these accents, guys. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, uh, JCR six three one one. Thank you so much. Twenty four pounds. That's uh, very kind. Saying enjoying the videos. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, and Kathy Stark. Thank you so much for the super chat. Saying where is Aya? Uh, when she's running scared in the season eight trailer. Is she in Winterfell, King's Landing, and from whom is she running? For those who haven't seen the trailer, um, I assume everyone has seen the trailer. If you uh, if you haven't and you're wanting to, uh, to escape all thought of it, feel free to skip forward for a couple of minutes. Uh, but she's, she's clearly in the trailer running away from something or think some people have done some video enhancement found two human looking figures are running after her. Um, Elamal, are you more up to speed on this than me? I've been away for the last week or so. Has, have people come up with some clear idea about whether this is Winterfell or King's Landing? Um, which one where Arya's running? Where Arya's running, yeah. Um, I've heard both and I'm not up to date on it. I'm I'm a little bad on keeping up to, to that sort of stuff. So yeah, I probably can't shed any light on that. Yeah, I think I think probably the experts on the the trailer and um, uh, the the minutiae of that kind of thing are probably not the two of us on here. My guess is that it is uh, underneath Winterfell. That's certainly how they were uh, trying to portray it. Um, and my I think so. uh, other guess is that um, uh, that this might, and this is purely a guess, is that this might be not just that Aya is scared and running away from something, but as she did with the waif uh, on the show, she's trying to draw some people into some kind of a trap because it, it doesn't seem her kind of game to be running away from two people. Um, but who knows? That's uh, that's where we're at. Um, oh, I think it's worth pointing out that Aria could certainly end up in King's Landing this season, She's one of the most mobile characters. Uh, I mean, she inherited Peter Baelish's uh, transporter when she killed Peter Baelish, and she could pretty much show up anywhere at any time, and as anybody, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, she could. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, I think I would agree that she will end up in King's Landing. That scene the, was cut, but right after she killed Peter Baelish, she took the little transporter out of his pocket, and she stuck it in her pocket. So that's the, the Baelish <laughs> teleporter. It's very useful. I mean, it is ab absolutely. Is, is this the one they gave to that raven? Um, no, I'm not even going to go there. Um, uh, well, Danny has. Uh, <laughs> no, Gendry's got one. So Gendry's yeah. got one. Uh, Danny's dragon has one. Yeah, I mean, there's just a few. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's the raven is the one that that's uh, that I think they, they must have given it given it to the raven to get anyway. And I'm not going there. I've uh, I've opined on that. Uh, um, a few too many times, I think. Um, uh, Crock and Tacos, uh, thank you so much. Uh, saying welcome back, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, LML, some reason can't send SCs to you, super chats to you. I assume this is on your stream. Um, yeah, don't worry about it. We're we already worked it out. Awesome. Uh, so LML has worked it out. Do not worry about it. But uh, thank you. I'm I'm glad that he can get his super chats. Um, oh, have we caught up on um, super chats here? That would be fantastic. Um, let's uh, actually, well, let's take a, a moment as we often do in the middle of these things. Uh, LML, do you want to just uh, highlight anything that's coming up in particular on your channel that you would like to let people know about that's, that's about to happen? Yes, I'd like to let people know that we Mythheads will be covering Game of Thrones season eight uh, pretty thoroughly um, during the season. Uh, my regular live stream, Robert, is every week is on Sundays at 3 Eastern, and we're just going to turn that into a pregame show. We'll go for two hours, and then we'll hand it off to you. You're going at 5 Eastern with your pregame show. We'll do a little cross-pollination, too, I'm sure. <clears throat> and then we're also going to do a little 
uh, right after the show's over. Fun and madness, quick reactions, live stream. Uh, you know, there'll be a couple other ones, but everyone's super excited after the show, I find. It wants a buzzing to talk about it. So we're going to do a quick reacts that night, think about it more, and then do a more like in-depth review the next week, the next morning. So the look for uh, Mythhead coverage on Sundays of the season eight. And then as far as if you guys don't know me, you may have heard I'm the Moon Meteor guy. You don't know really what it's about or whatever. Go to my web page luciferminslightbringer.com or go to my YouTube page, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, and pinned at the top of each one, there's one video. It's a live video of me talking at Con of Thrones uh, last year. It's like 45 minutes, and it's basically my main theory in a nutshell. So if you're wondering if I'm completely crazy or maybe only half crazy in the good kind of way, then that's the video to check out to sort of decide. Uh, we do have a lot of fun we and the quote unquote myth heads on our Starry Wisdom Sundays and anybody can join, even if you haven't read all the books or you've just read them one time, it doesn't matter. You can get into it. So check out that one video and you can see it's tons of fun, symbolism, mythology, you know, lit nerd stuff um, and obviously silly costumes and occasionally cover, you know, covers of Weezer songs. So that, that's what we're about. Excellent. And I would highly recommend you do uh, go and check out LML's channel. Uh, and I will, I keep on saying it, but at some point I will actually get around to properly inviting him. I will get him on at some point to do one of the videos that I do uh, from time to time. My favorite theory, uh, when I get a creator on, I just get them to outline their favorite theory about something or other, because I think it'd be really useful just to have, give people a chance just to hear uh, as LML does come on this channel quite a lot, just to hear us talk through what is his sort of central idea about uh, how effectively it's how magic works and how this whole thing uh, works in terms of symbolism in, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, in terms of my channel, as we're talking about what's going to happen in season eight, I've put up my... Uh, well, this is what, what I'm hoping will be my schedule, um, obviously, thing events happen and life happens but what i hope will be my shadow is up there on twitter if you don't follow me on twitter just go and have a look for indie geek over on twitter and i will put the same schedule up on uh, my youtube site as well um what i'm going to be doing as lml said at five o'clock every sunday so four hours before game of thrones happens i will be doing uh, a live stream a sort of a pre-show live stream i'll pick up from uh, LML, um, and I will have a guest on each time there, and we'll pick through what happened in the previous episode, and we'll try and look forward to what happened in the next episode, and we'll try and keep that to two hours so that we can, uh, everyone has got a chance to go away and grab a bite to eat before the actual uh, event itself. Uh, then, within 24 hours of the episode will be my episode breakdown. Uh, the next day, on a month, on the Tuesday, I will do a breakdown of if they've got a trailer for the next episode i'll break that down um uh, i'm going to carry on doing the well-told tale for those who do not know my second channel where i do audio narrations of what i consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy books um we, we're doing things like hp lovecraft frankenstein things like that um just me reading the books uh that's coming out every wednesday all through the season then uh thursday will be another live stream as normal the usual time here this usual slot i think mostly that's just going to be me a chance for some patron questions as well as uh, whatever comes up in the chat we'll just take it wherever it goes whatever's come up through the week and then i'm going to uh, on the friday and saturday i'm aiming to do another video maybe two videos on just whatever subject people are saying they want me to do a video on so i'll try and be quite reactive if something comes up a question that people have got, I will try and do something. So that's what I'm going to be doing. It's it's quite a lot of stuff, but I think uh, I think I can do it as this is the whole point of me taking a nice big holiday is I can be nice and uh, rested and full of, uh, full of energy for the season coming forward. So that's my plan. In terms of stuff before that, I am going to do a bit more on my series on the Tower of Joy. I've got two Tower of Joy videos I've decided I'm going to be doing. The first one, the first, both of them hopefully will come out before the series, before season eight. First one is going to have some, the title something like, How Did Ned Know Where to Go? How Did He Know Where the Tower of Joy Was? Um, and then that's going to cover all of the ground leading up to the moment when he arrives at the Tower of Joy. And then the second one is going to be what actually happened 
back to the Tower of Joy itself. So I've got two videos coming up on that. Um, and I'm going to do a few random season eight videos, more character studies of a few of the main characters uh, that just try and understand where their character arc has taken them, not just trying to speculate about what, what happened in season eight, but trying to work out where has their character arc taken them thus far? And what might that tell us about where their end game is? So that's what's coming up on my channels. The only other thing I will say at this point is what I say every single time. Patrons, thank you. I could not do this without you. The, your support is what allows me to have the time and space to be able to do things like this. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, if you're at all interested in supporting the channel uh, or if you want access to um, early access to pretty much everything I do, as well as some exclusive stuff I do just for my patrons, like readings from the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter. If you're interested in that at all, please check out my Patreon page. There's a link down in the description. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say at that point. Let's get back into the questions. Uh, we'll do a couple from Patreon. Um, uh, Pegleg, Pete uh, asked over on Patreon, uh, I was thinking about not uh, not answering, just replying directly, asking if I'm for Brexit or against Brexit. Um, uh, I, the reason I've, I'm answering this one quickly is just to say I, um, I have deliberately kept this channel politics free because I am personally trying my very best uh, to see this channel uh, and the community as a whole and to play my part to try and bring people together um, not to divide people. And I think that this is a wonderful world and a wonderful community we've got here. So for my part, I'm not bringing real world politics into it. Um, I have strong political views. Uh, for those who have been keeping up to date with uh, what's going on in the UK uh, and who have been watching this channel for a while, I suspect that my uh, my views will probably lead you to a correct assumption about my thoughts on things like Brexit. But as I say, I'm not covering that in, on this channel. Maybe one day I will launch a separate, more politics-y uh, online um, identity and do a channel or something that, that allows a little bit more scope for thinking around real world issues. Um, but let's get into, so John St. Baptiste had a question. Uh, hi there, John. Uh, John has got a wonderful um, YouTube channel of his own. If you're interested in music, I highly recommend you go and check it out. Uh, do you have any theories about the huge 8,000 year gap in time? Did it really happen? So this is the uh, the very noticeable fact that all with the, the ancient history we have, apparently the building of the wall, the, the others coming, uh, the Knights King thing, all the stuff like that happened apparently 8,000 or so years ago. And then we get this long period of, yes, the stuff's going on, but the world doesn't hasn't moved forward hugely. And then suddenly the others return. So the question is, why is there that 8,000 year gap? Uh, LML, do you have any particular thoughts on why that's the case, why we do have this big, long gap? Um, can you rephrase the whole question for me? Uh, do you have any theories about this 8,000 year gap in time? First of all, did it really happen? And secondly, why did George R. R. Martin make it such a long gap when he could have just made it a thousand years or, or a few hundred years? I think the goal was to push it back a little beyond um, anything that could be reliable history. I think that's the point. And if it's only like 4,000 years ago, like, you know, in, in our own real world is the easy way to compare it. 4,000 years ago is about 2000 BC. We have a pretty good idea of what empires existed and what even some of the names of the kings and things were. We're like, we, we have facts about that time. Um, and obviously a lot we don't know and, and constantly history is corrected, but it's a factual time as opposed to a mythical time. You got to go back a little further to get to like the Atlantis level of fog of history where almost anything is, you know, theoretically possible. So I also think that George is in general mimicking our own timeline a little bit. And Atlantis supposedly is 10,000 BC, which is like 12,000 years ago. And so I think that he's chasing after that sort of feel for this long night event. It's, you know, that where there's evidence, like, for example, Robert, almost every religion has a flood myth. The famous one is the biblical flood myth to those of us in Western civilization. But there's flood myths around most of the world. And scientists now think that this is largely 
traceable to the melting down of the ice caps during the end of the last ice age over a period of time from about 13,000 BC to 7,000 BC. There were three periods in which it happened. There was a lot of melting suddenly. It wasn't a steady decline. There's like some fits and starts, which by the way, they think might have been brought on by meteor impacts or comet impacts. But that's getting a far afield. The point is like when you have things that old in time, they become just the right amount of historical event and just the right amount of it's hard to say. And so 8,000 years is, is a kind of a pretty good number. It gives him time to have Valeria exist afterwards and fall. It gives him time to bring the Andals over 4,000 years ago or whenever that happened. Um, so, yeah, I just think it works. I think I agree with you. It's uh, it's a deliberately long period of time uh, to try and make things turn very clearly uh, legendary. I think that uh, it's it, George R. R. Martin has, has made a point of uh, that we can't trust anything from these legends. This is just a, a long, long time ago. So, um, uh, I. 8,000 years, I, I love what you were saying there about the sort of the links across to human history, but I think that it's almost, it, it, it could be, he's been quite vague about it, it could be 12,000 years ago, we don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is that this is a long time ago. And yes, I do think it was, uh, did it happen? Uh, John, you were asking, did it, what, was there that long gap? And I think, yes, there was, um, simply because, the other things that we know happened do also seem to have happened a very long time ago. So we know that there was the the, the Andal invasion and things like that. So uh, we can sort of iterate back through time from the Targaryen invasion, uh, which we can be reasonably clear on when, when that was, to the, the, the Ruinish and then the Andals and so on. So that, that bit seems reasonably clear. Johan uh, Eriksson um, with a hundred, I think that's Swedish Krona. Thank you so much. Uh, good to have you back, Robert. Thank you. It's great to be back. A uh, little late to the stream, but we'll watch the first part tomorrow. Question for LML. Will you make any videos on the symbolism in the Duncan Egg stories? Well, that's a fantastic question. I've got something that I want to put to LML that I was talking to Lady Gwyn, uh, two or three weeks ago, actually, when we were talking about the Duncan Egg stories on a live stream. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But first of all, the, as, as a question, are you going to be doing anything specifically about the symbolism in Duncan Egg? So I answered this one in the chat. Um, I probably will at some point just because I really love Duncan Egg and they're packed with symbolism for sure. Um, I mentioned Duncan Egg a lot as it is, particularly in the Weirwood Compendium. And I was telling them that my next uh, Weird Compendium episode will have a lot of Duncan Egg. There's a there's so much Green Seer symbolism coded in their sigils. I'm not sure if that was what your question was going to be about the sigils. Is that where you were going to go with it? Um, it, it? It wasn't, but but uh, yeah, I'd be interested. So, so the Dunk, at the risk of sort of uh, stealing your thunder here, so Dunk's sigil of the, the the shooting star and the tree clearly has that kind of symbolism. Is that where you were going to go, go with it? Yeah, so the shooting star and the tree is about the fire of the gods. Um, it, to me, Lightbringer and the Weirwood are almost twin symbols. They both symbolize the fire of the gods. Uh, the idea of a tree that is burning but is not consumed calls out to the burning bush. And the reason why I'm talking about the Weirwood as a burning tree, for those of you who may not know, it, usually the, the red leaves of the Weirwood are described as bloody hands. That description is used a lot. But one time, the red canopy of the weirwood is called a blaze of flame amongst the green. And so you got this idea that these bloody hands can look like blood and fire. And then you look at the tree, it's bone white and it's got this bloody face. So it kind of looks like a person that's either bleeding and burning or, or both. Um, and of course, like I said, a, a burning tree is a call out to the burning bush of Moses. It burns, but it's not consumed. Martin also uses that language for the glass candle, uh, which is also compared to the weirwood tree because you can use both to sort of pop into people's dreams and all that stuff. So it's all fire of the God stuff. So when you see the tree and the shooting star, it's calling out to a lot of stuff. The storm God's thunderbolt, for example, that sets the tree on fire in the, in the Grey King myth. <clears throat> That's supposedly how the Grey King got the fire of the gods from the storm God 
for man. He got it through this burning tree and it was set on fire by, quote, a thunderbolt, which I would call the moon meteor. Moon meteors were not moon, not moon meteors, but meteors and comets were frequently called thunderstones by ancient man. And they were basically equated with very big thunderbolts that leave a stone behind. So Dunk's got that sigil. He's also got the gallows knight, though, which has a hanged man. And a hanged man is a call out to Odin, who was hung on Yggdrasil. You know about Yggdrasil and Odin and all that stuff? Yeah. So he, hang, he hung nine days on that windy tree until he could see the runes. And then he transcended death and gained magic and stuff. So there's a lot of hanged man imagery all throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. You can consider Bloodraven a hanged man because he's pinioned by the weirwood uh, roots. So he's he's hung on the tree, but just down in the roots. And then Barak was hung. It goes on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> so you've got the Gallows Knight. You've got the tree and shooting star sigil. Uh, doesn't he have... Oh, and then there's the winged chalice of Arlen that he starts out the whole story with. And the winged chalice is a symbol of the Holy Grail, which gets into magical bloodlines and, you know, Christ stuff and you know, the descendant of God and the son of God. And again, the fire of the gods and the combination of man and God, all these things are implied. So there's, it's very, very rich, but yeah. What were you going to ask me about your excellent stream that you did with Lady Gwyn, which I was uh, very fascinated by, by the way. Um, well, I just pick up on something you there about the hanged man. So one of the things that uh, I, I mentioned that I honestly can't remember who pointed it out to me. It was somebody in the community and, this is me trying to give them credit back to it. The, the opening scene of each of the three Duncan, Duncan Egg stories has Dunk looking at a dead body, um, which I think is too often for coincidence now. If it had just been two of the three, then yeah, it's fine. But clearly there's this, uh, this association as you've got this with the hanged man, with Dunk and death in some way. Um, but that wasn't what I was going to say. So the, the bit that I was going to... Uh, go off of was that uh, a a video that I have too many ideas for videos I know but a video that I will definitely do some point after season eight is something to do with the centrality of Dunk and uh, Lady Gwyn was talking about we were asked a question about Dunk's foot now for those who've read the stories we know that Dunk uh, should have lost his foot um, but didn't, should have lost it because, you know, this, this is what uh, Aryan Targaryen threatened to cut off his foot. Um, and Dunk often looks at it afterwards, or two or three times looks at it afterwards and ponders um, why it was that he should have kept his foot and other people should die and thinks things like maybe one day the kingdom will need this foot. Um, and Lady Gwyn was, was speculating that perhaps this might have a a big importance at, say, Summer Hall, where we know that that's where Dunk, so Duncan the Tall, died. Maybe he uses his foot to hold open a door or something like that. There's a lot of imagery there with his potential descendant, Hodor, holding closed a door, perhaps, and Dunk holding open a door, so maybe that's there. But the the bit that I want to run past you is this kind of symbolism, because I'm, I'm trying to build up this case that Dunk is central to the story in a way that we don't necessarily think of immediately, which is it is through him, not through his particular actions so much, but just him being who he is, he acts as the catalyst that creates the right bloodline to allow prophecy to come uh, in, on the throne, to allow prophecy to come true. Clearly, there's already, uh, we get um, the, the heir to the throne. This is the whole plot of the Hedge Knights. The heir to the throne dies, uh, and that's Dunk's fault within Baylor, uh, within the, the, the fight that's going on there. Um, we see uh, that Dunk, uh, I think it was Amanda uh, in uh, Disputed Lands, Crayford's daughter, pointed out that Dunk took uh, Egg down to Dawn and Dawn didn't su suffer from the spring sickness, so perhaps that provided him some immunity which kept him alive, and yet I forget which I forgot which other Targaryen died. Uh, and all of these things happen which brought Aegon the Fifth to the throne. He was Aegon the Unlikely because he shouldn't have inherited. And the reason why he inherited is because of the actions, unknowingly, of dunk 
that's my thesis that I'm trying to work up. Uh, always spoil my future videos on my live streams. I'm wondering whether there is um, any symbolism or something that shows Dunk as being central as this kind of catalyst. We see, and I'll throw to you in just one second, Blood Raven. There are a couple of instances in those stories. One when he meets him um, uh, and he looks at him and he says, I'm wondering about your role in all of this. Um, and Dunk remembers also way back beforehand when he saw Blood Raven looking at him, even before when he was just a young lad, he was just riding past in King's Landing and looked at him as if he was sore through him. So it's as if Blood Raven realizes that Dunk is important and has an important role. Um, what, do you have anything to add to this is my question. I'm, I'm trying to crowdsource this. I love it when when the, the, the community come together to get different perspectives on stuff. Do you have anything in terms of symbolism that showed Dunk to be this kind of catalyst figure? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, he watched the dragon come. Spatters of mud sprayed back from the hooves of Prince Arion's gray and Dunk could see the horse's nostrils flaring, the black lance still angled upward. A knight who holds his lance high and brings it online at the last moment always risks lowering it too far, the old man had told him. He brought his own point to bear on the center of the princeling's chest. My lance is part of my arm, he told himself. It's my finger, a wooden finger. All I need to do is touch him with my long wooden finger. He tried not to see the sharp point of, at the end of Arion's black lance, growing larger with every stride. The dragon, look at the dragon, he thought. The great three-headed beast covered the prince's shield, red wings and gold fire. No, look only where you mean to strike, he remembered suddenly, but his lance had already begun to slide offline. So then it goes on. So basically, Dunk is a tree and he's described as a tree in a lot of different ways, but that's what all his green seer stuff is about. He's huge. He's seven feet tall, oak and iron guard me well. He's like a castle wall. He's basically a tree with a wooden finger and he's reaching out for this dragon to touch it. This is kind of like somebody using the weirwoods to basically reach out and touch the comet or touch the moon and cause the long night explosion. And everything that happens after that impact gives you all that stuff. You get flying dragons, um, Arion's waving a triple morning star over his head about to smash Dunk. There's the dream of the of the big black dragon falling on top of Dunk, but he doesn't die. That's like a meteor impact. So there's all kinds of just bonkers symbolism going on there. But in the middle of it all is Dunk acting like a tree. So when you're talking about Dunk being this vessel that clears the line of succession for egg and orchestrates things to happen unknowingly, it's like he, it's like he's the tree that a green seer uses to manipulate events. If Blood Raven can manipulate the Raven, for example, he could also manipulate the Weirwoods and other things like that. So in at least in a symbolic sense, Dunk is like a tree that can be used by a green seer to reach out and touch things with his wooden finger. And so that's what he's doing is affecting events all through his life. That's that's what I got for you. I I love it. And I think that that exactly picks up on where I'm seeing this going, is that it's not that Dunk is deliberately going around and altering the Targaryen succession. It's just that by his sheer presence, it makes stuff happen around him. Uh, I think it was uh, might have been the Bard in, in the, um, the chat was pointing out, of course, there's his involvement in the abortive uh, Second Blackfire Rebellion as well. Uh, so it just seems to be where he goes, he is protecting the future Aegon V's claim to the throne. He's making sure that he gets onto the throne. He's not doing it deliberately. He's just being him. And he's being like this catalyst. And so I love this idea of him being this weirwood, effective, affecting the um, Targaryen bloodline, allowing them to reach that point where we have the, the, um, the Blackwoods and the Targaryens joined as they are, uh, which seems to be Blood Raven's plan. But I think we've, we've waffled on uh, for too long for that. That's that's me uh, trying to make best use of uh, LML's wisdom for a, a video in the future. I will try and remember to give him due credit uh, when I do get to it. Um, 
Uh, Token Joe, thank you so much, uh, $10. Uh, welcome back, Robert. Uh, I hope you had an excellent time away. I did, it was amazing, thank you. Uh, and are ready for the season eight fun. YouTube was dark and full of terrors without you. Well, that's very kind. There are many, many light bringers among us who can, uh, who can help uh, us all through. Uh, Ellen King, um, uh, this is from uh, Bryce's Loreen. So this is uh, picking up, I always say this, but I love it when people pick up questions from others in the chat that we don't spot. Uh, it's very easy to see super chats that the other things can go by very quickly when we're here doing this uh, so it's quite easy for us to miss them when we're talking uh, so i love it when people do super chats on behalf of other people so thank you so much ellen that's very kind um who do you want to see in the pre-world story uh i assume this is a question about the spin-off um uh so this is the the spin-off which is the long night does that have what you think as well nml yeah been, that's yeah. that's the only confirmed one yeah yeah so um uh, in terms of the the in the long night i think they're going to be pulling together lots of different things that we've got going on to make them all happen in the same kind of time frame so i think we're going to see an awful lot of the kind of the characters that we know and the stories that we know are happening at the same kind of time i think um uh, in terms of which characters i w i would love to see what the reality was of land the clever if they do this uh, partly because clearly this is an archetype of Tyrion, who as you know is my favorite character but also it's one of those ones where the story is just so wonderfully um uh, unmagical and yet almost slightly unbelievable which seems to imply that it's not just that hey there's this hero has who did a magical thing and then something happened uh, it's somebody who achieved things just by being clever and i love the idea that there's somebody who achieved things just by being clever and i'd like to know what the clever thing that they did which uh, has gone down through history and, and created lots of different legends around it. So that's that's what I particularly like to see. Elmo, is there anything you particularly like to see? Oh, uh, I mean, it's like offer me candy here. Yeah, well, um, pick one. <laughs> well, so the only we haven't we don't have any clues about what they're doing with the show. It's so wide open. All we can say is is that they have quite the menu to choose from. They got a, quite a buffet table of fun ideas. Obviously. We're going to have skin changers and wargs. That is for sure. We'll definitely have an ancient Stark. We'll have a backstory for Night's King, and how he got tied to that tree. We'll have children of the forest. That much we know. Um, we might have ancient Ironborn. We might not. They were only so popular in this in the show. They could be cut. Um, they can play fast and loose with history is what I'm saying. 5,000 years, 10,000 years. It doesn't matter to them. If they want Valerians, they can have Valerians. If they want to bring, if they want to say, "Well, we'll bring the Dragon Lords from Ashai," they can. I mean, from a marketing standpoint, it seems like why wouldn't they have dragons? But I think maybe I heard that they said there wasn't going to be dragons. Of course, that could always be so that they can surprisingly bring in the dragons at some point as an escalation. Because in my mind, if they did have dragons, they'd only be like the people from far off, not the main thing like they are now. So. We we could obviously going to have some first men. Um, it wouldn't be wouldn't surprise me if they moved the Andal invasion to this time point. Even though I don't think in book canon that the Andal truthers are right, and I think the Andal invasion does happen long after the Long Night, like like we're told. Um, uh, in the show, they can do whatever they want. The Andals are already established. It wouldn't surprise me if they made that choice. Um, and then they've also got all like Garth the Green and Land the Clever and all those kinds of things. So they can use the cool thing about the showrunners for this is that they can do anything they want. They can choose to use the legends closely or only vaguely. They can make up completely new characters. I mean, it's way looser than adapting Game of Thrones. So I'm I'm just hoping it'll be good, mainly Robert, and that it will be able to have fun covering it and that it won't be, you know, like, oh, God, this is terrible. So that's the main thing I'm hoping for. Yeah, I agreed. Um, I just spotted in the chat, Joe Magician saying, Baal the Bard, you're just full of good ideas today. Baal the Bard, for those who don't know, is Gretchen. Um, and Gretchen is going to be on this channel 
in, I think, a couple of weeks' time. Uh, she's going to be doing a live stream here. Gretchen is amazing and is always full of uh, fantastic thoughts and ideas. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, I'm sure you all make her feel very welcome. But uh, it's fantastic to see you there in the chat. Um, a couple of questions from Patreon. I just want to pick up on, as I say, we're dotting about all over the place with this. Um, uh, let's talk about Liana. Frown Pouch said, do you assume that Liana was doing some level of skin changing with her horse? That's always been my interpretation. Now, this is based on the idea or a few different things. We never see anything from her point of view. Obviously, Liana, she's dead long before the, the series uh, and the books. But we do get a couple of characters, I think, uh, Barbary Dustin says something like she she was half horse, that woman. Um, I think we get Ruth Bolton say something along something similar along the lines about how how good a horsewoman she was. Um, uh, this is one of the things that we know about her is how good she was with horses. So um, I think the short answer is we don't know. Uh, because it's never made explicit. It would kind of make sense in that clearly we have a whole generation of Starks that we see on the in the books and the show who have got some kind of skin-changing, sometimes latent skin-changing abilities, sometimes very much to the fore. Um, so it would make sense if the previous generation also had that. Um, for me, I think it's probably most likely to be George R. R. Martin giving us hints that actually Leanna could very well be the Knight of the Laughing Tree, because this idea that actually she was incredibly gifted um, and could conceivably take on and uh, defeat three knights. Um, if, if we hadn't had the information that she was an exceptionally gifted horsewoman and that she um, was uh, good at fighting and often fought with her brothers and things like that, then the whole idea becomes quite far-fetched. But because we've got the information that she is exceptional at riding a horse, we get to the idea that perhaps this might be possible. Because of course, riding in a joust isn't just like the, and we get this time and time again, incidentally from the Duncan Egg stories, when Dunk says, you know, he's not actually that good at the jousting, it's the hand-to-hand -hand that he's quite good at when his size can come into, uh, into full effect. Um, with the jousting, it's as much to do with horsemanship, horsewomanship, and accuracy. And therefore, there is every reason to believe that Liana could have done. So I personally think this is more George signposting us towards that. But LML, what do you think? Do you think there might be some kind of skin-changing thing going on there? I think it's only meant to be like a hint of skin-changing, just a <laughs> sort of a suggestion of skin-changing, like... Perhaps if Leanna had gotten a dire wolf that it incur would have encouraged her gift, it may have come out. And instead, all we got was she's really good with horses and, uh, you know, almost like a centaur was, was the description, her and her brother Brandon. And I think there are some clues that skin changers, even before they're actually skin changing animals, might be able to be a little more in tune with animals just to start with. Um, I mean, it's kind of only logical, so. And yes, I, I do have blue roses on tap, thanks to some of the myth heads. So I had to break that out in honor of Leanna. Well, I, before we went on uh, went live, then uh, Alamel admitted that he's now got just out of sight his entire um, wardrobe, as far as I can tell, of different hats and different things that he can change into at a moment's notice. That, just oh, pro oh, oh. proving the point. Oh, oh, uh, oh, I know, I know. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, guys, I, I don't know how to respond sometimes to LML. He's just uh, either a crazy genius or just crazy. Uh, I'll let you decide. Uh, um, we've got another question from uh, Patreon. This is an Isle of Faces question. Um, well, sort of. Uh, if the belief is that is that the this is from Benjamin Johnson, hi Benjamin, uh, that the Isle of Faces is the hub or the center of the Weirwood Net, which I do kind of subscribe to. It kind of makes sense. Um, do you believe that the shade of the evening trees have a similar hub? And if so, where do you think that would be? The shade of the evening trees are 
uh, and I'm sure LML will be able to wax lyrical on the symbolism here, but they're sort of like the uh, put across as the, the opposite of weirwood trees. They seem to have very similar uh, kind of um, imagery given to them and also the idea that their paste is magical and huge amounts of other things going on there. Um, so in, in terms of the question of do they have a similar hub, we don't know. As far as I'm aware, the only time we're actually told about them growing somewhere is around um, the House of the Undying. So it would make sense perhaps if that is their sort of hub. I don't think we've heard of them growing in other places, but um, LML, tell us a little bit about the symbolism and if you do know of any other um, places where they grow, then that would also be really interesting. Well, I have to say that <clears throat> I'm basically waiting for Grow Food's daughter to uh, set the record straight on the those damn shade trees. They are perplexing. Um, obviously, when you look at them, they seem like inverted weirwoods. Weirwoods have white bark and red leaves, dark red leaves. Shaded evening trees have black bark and dark blue leaves. They both produce a psychedelic substance, which when you consume it, the descriptions are very similar if you compare those two, as many have done. And if you look at the visions that Danny has and Bran has, very similar montages of visions. There's <clears throat> the maze symbolism is used for both of them. In the Weirwoods, it's more of a metaphorical labyrinth, kind of drawing on the Minotaur labyrinth stuff at Winterfell and the maze of the Weirwood network. And then at, at the House of the Undying, it's literally a maze that Danny's wandering through, but it doesn't really exist. It seems to be an illusion uh, in some sense. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of obvious comparisons, but what actually are the shade trees? Are they like poison? Are they not poison, but like magically altered weirwoods? Are they just the magical trees that grow on Essos because they don't have weirwoods there? Instead, they have shade trees. It's just a, just a great place to create theories and tinfoil and speculate we just don't have enough to know for sure. But Crow Food's daughter is brilliant, as you know, and I think that she is digging, digging, um, you know, she's looking for it. She's also got some cool theories about the oily black stone being formed from petrified shade of the evening trees <clears throat> because the shade uh, drink is described as oily and black and it's got all these darkness and midnight associations. So that's a pretty cool theory. And of course you can find that video on Crow Food's Daughter's uh, channel, The Disputed Lands. So I'm not sure. I, I tend to think it's mostly a symbolic connection and that there isn't a direct connection to the Weirwoods, but maybe we'll find out one day. I don't know. I, I think it's mostly George using it as a parallel. Like for example, the most important thing in that whole bit to me, besides Danny's actual visions, is the fact that the other, um, the undying Freudian slip are described as cold blue shadows. And they're gathering around this beating blue heart, which is really makes you think of like the heart of winter and the others. Their others are white shadows instead of you know blue shadows, but they're both cold shadows and dark sorcerers that are trying to live forever kind of. So then Drogon comes in and roasts the undying and burns the heart. So to me, this is really good foreshadowing of Drogon fighting the others and and burning a bunch of them. So that's that's what I saw in that scene. But I defer to Amanda as far as what the literal truth of the, the shade trees are. And if there's a hub, we've only seen them in one place, so we'd have to guess Karth, but maybe a shy, you know, maybe somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that, that, that was all excellent. I think the only thing I would add is that in terms of the plot, the kind of the, the symbolism, the, the symmetry, comes into play with Euron, who um, I won't go into all of the details now, but in many ways he's a kind of like a, a, a sort of a mirror image of symmetry with Bran. There are lots of hints that that Bloodraven also tried to get in contact with him when he was a child with the same kind of dreams to see whether or not he is magical. And in the way that Bran, when he got up to uh, Blood Raven. He was fed the weirwood paste, um, which we might talk about it as being Jojen paste, but I don't think there's any doubt that there was definitely some weirwood paste in there as well. Um, 
that was what actually unleashed his magical powers, unleashed his green seer powers. What seems to have happened with Euron is it's drinking the shade of the evening. He got hold of a barrel of it when uh, he found Piet Pri and, and three of the other um, warlocks. They had a barrel of the stuff and he took hold of that. He started drinking it in huge amounts. That seems to have unleashed his powers. And so we're sort of seeing him as this kind of dark warped version of a green seer with what he's been doing so that's where that kind of like um uh, symbolism comes in and where, where it's important for the story because in the previous chapters from winds of winter then we see that he is being driven by the visions that he's getting through that and those are the kinds of things that he's trying to make a reality dark mother thank you so much 25 dollars saying i love the bucket so much i think this is uh, this is your bucket lml uh, so you get it getting some love for that um, uh, Michelle Kalen, uh, who you did the super chat right before we started, actually, now said we will get to your questions, which you left on um, uh, Patreon uh, at some point, and we have got to them now. Um, this is, uh, well, I'll read it. I think I'll read it all out because it's quite it's interesting. Uh, Melisandre, an enigma, of course, on they all, but her good uh, Lord of Light uh, seems pretty shadowy. She loves fire, but you never hear her worshiping the sun. And if it's like she loves the fire for, sh it's like she loves the fire for the shadow that it casts, burning kids, adults, and so on. Um, also, the imagery with the light bringer that we were talking about earlier about you know having to kill uh, someone in order to bring about light bringer. Um, in so much as there are good or bad folk in the Song of Ice and Fire, do you think that the Lord of Light and his followers are good? Um, uh, so, um, da, 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 da. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that, that's probably actually captured it. So the, the question is, is the Lord of Light, Melisandre, are they good in as much as any characters are good? Or... Are they evil or are they something else? And I will I will kick this off and I'll go to LML in a moment. I've got quite a few thoughts on this one, but I'll start off with just one thought, which is that I think we have to um, see a difference in the way that the show frames things, which is very much good versus evil, um, living versus dead, that kind of thing. Uh, and the book, which is a lot more ice versus fire, and both of them are quite neutral, and it's a matter of what you do with the power um, in the way that sort of, imagine how Davos reacts to things. It's not whether or not you're doing a thing because the god tells you to do something that makes it good. It's actually, is that thing good or evil? Um, and I think that is what George R. R. Martin is wanting us to look at, is not whether or not the god that is being worshipped is good or evil. It is, are the acts, the human acts on the ground, are those good or evil? But what, what are your, what's your position on all of this? Well, I think that the easiest way to understand the, what George is trying to say with, with his use of magic is to see it as an analog for power. Now, that's exact, that's essentially what it is, is it's raw power. And most of, you can see that power is one of the most clear themes of the story in general whether it's political power or magical power or personal power that some a manipulator wields over a person or that a person reclaims back by reclaiming their identity or whatever it is. Like there's themes of power everywhere. And magic really just sort of fits into that. Magic also serves as a really good uh, analog for technology, which again is, is our modern form of, of power. You know, we can travel to the stars. We can create a pandemic disease if we're not careful. We can make a nuclear bomb that blows up the earth, or we could make a, maybe one day make a power source that is more environmentally friendly. Who knows? Like science is a dual edged sword. It's that sword without a hilt a little bit. Like it's right. I mean, I guess there is a hilt, but it's, it's dangerous. You have to be cautious, got to be careful. And so I think magic serves as an analog for all those ideas. And so when you see Martin talking about the cost of magic and the, the, you know, the, the effect of it, then that's that's really what he wants to talk about is the human cost because that's why he, he beats it into our heads you know the hardened conflict that's the only thing worth writing about according to Faulkner and so whatever he's doing with magic or politics 
He's always thinking about how does it pull on the hearts of the characters and create these situations. And so you see people caught up in these horrible, very difficult decisions about how to use their magic. Daenerys thinks about what am I? Am I the mother of monsters? What have I unleashed upon the world? Like these are the important moments for George when their characters stop and reflect on the cost of things. So that's just his bread and butter. Yeah, I agree with all of that. So um, Michelle, I hope that sort of answers that for you. I think we're we're in agreement. George R. R. Martin does not do good or evil characters. He invites us to draw our own judgments as to these things. And Melisandre as a character is very similar to Bloodraven in that they have this idea of this greater good that they think they're serving and they will do things that people might think are evil or bad or wrong because they think it serves the greater good. So Melisandre herself thinks that she is a good character. She is doing the right thing. Um, we are invited through people like Davos to critically assess whether or not she is doing the right thing. We're never going to see, pardon me, we're never going to see the Lord of Light appear in this. We're never going to learn whether or not the Lord of Light is even a real thing. George R. Martin has been reasonably clear about that. What we are going to be shown is the effect of the belief in the Lord of Light. And that is the thing that we're being invited to, to consider and to judge. Yeah, well said. Um, Linda Prasuta, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for the Patreon. You did a super chat earlier as well, um, saying if revenge is what's most important to the Night King, which is a question in and of itself, and if Bran is a collection of all the Three-Eyed Ravens or Green Seers, and if the Night King is a collection of all the Night King captains and they are ancient enemies, do you think it could be because a Three-Eyed Raven or Green Seer was part of the Children of the Forest creating the Night King? Well, there's a lot going on in there. It's a fantastic question. There's a lot going on there. So let's sort of break this down into a couple of different parts. Um, the if Is Bran now on the show all of the three-eyed ravens or green seers now and what does that actually mean who who are these let's be run as clear as we can when bran says he i'm no longer bran stark i am you know the green seer i'm the three-eyed crow or the three-eyed raven um what does that mean that he is in terms of this consciousness it means that he's in the in-between state of being fully absorbed into a hive mind and being an individual. Uh, we know that the green seers, when they die, become a part of a collective consciousness, which of course is something that George loves to write about, being an old deadhead and a hippie. A lot of his sci-fi books have some sort of collective conscious hive mind kind of thing going on. And so essentially when a green seer dies, he fully gets absorbed into that consciousness as fully as one can be. Uh, but before they die, and after they've hooked up to the Weirwoods, they're in somewhat of an in-between state, where they're they're half the Weirwood mind and half still Bran or still Bloodraven. And so in the books, for example, Bloodraven talks to Bran for a little while, and then he's like, hey, I gotta go, the trees are calling. And so he's basically so absorbed into the Weirwoods that he can only spend a few hours inhabiting his old corpse body and then he's like, man, I'm tired. I got to go back into the trees. He's been there for like 80, 50 years or something. So Bran on the show is newly joined up to this hive mind consciousness. And he still has his brand self, but it's very changed and it's only partly there. So he's not purely just a walking brand puppet body with the weirwood mind inhabiting it. Like he is still somewhat Bran, but he's in that in-between state. That's probably the best way I could say it. Yeah, I think that's uh, fascinating, uh, and I think absolutely spot on. Um, the the bit that I would pick up on on this question from Linda that I find a really interesting um, uh, possibility is that if Bran is this kind of hive mind of all of these green seers who've come up into the Weirwood network, that means that part of him is probably was probably involved in the start of all of this. So somewhere deep down inside is somebody who may well be responsible in some way for what happened way back then. 
whether Bran can access that or knows what to look for is another matter because one of the things that we saw in the show was it's very clear that Bran isn't suddenly uh, omniscient. He doesn't suddenly know everything. He has to be told to look for something. It took Sam coming up and saying, hey, I've just discovered such and such uh, for, for Bran to then go in and like, sift through the the memory banks and go oh yeah actually i can see here was here's Rhaegar and liana getting married um he actually needs to know what to look for so the question is if there is part of him this hive mind was somehow responsible for it he know he needs to know to go and look for that i do not know whether they will get into that on the show but i think it's a fascinating possibility that's actually a really good point if he were if there was no brand left and he was just the weirwood mind of all the three-eyed ravens combined, then he would already know about RLJ because Blood Raven damn sure knew about RLJ. So this shows that like the half that's brand that's talking to people is, is the brand part, but he's also partly the weirwood mind, which is all the three-eyed ravens that have ever existed. So the the active brand parts got to like scan the other part for information and then come back and be like oh yeah this is what happened so that that proves that there is some brands still there that's distinct you know but he's not brand anymore quote unquote you know and he is in a sense all the three eyed ravens but it's it's not that simple it's like this is magical metaphysics you can't just you know black and white it you got a, a little nuance to it yeah yeah absolutely. Uh, Jay Star, thank you so much for the super chat. Can dire wolves or a wolf pack kill whites or the white king, white walkers or the night king? Um, we don't have huge amounts of evidence on this, but we do have back in book one, show one, um, we have that incident when we had uh, the white who attacked Joe or Mormont. And then we get a uh, ghost coming into the rescue. What we find there is that the thing which killed it was fire rather than the dire wolf. That doesn't mean that dire wolves can't do that, but I think that they're magic, they, they are magical creatures, but that uh, there's no evidence that they are, uh, they have the same effect as the, the three things, the trifecta of things that kill white walkers, certainly in show law being. Dragon glass, Valyrian steel, and and fire, or not white walkers, the uh, the whites, I should say. Um, is is there anything uh, LML that suggests that the the magicness of direwolves might have something other than them having this link across to uh, the Starks in connection with the white walkers, as it were? Well, the closest thing I could come to that would be that um, Ghost uh, seems to sense the whites. You know, he wakes John up in his chambers when they're in the castle. He's the one that goes and finds the whited hand of Jafer Flowers. So the dire wolves are potentially to be thought of as magical creatures. According to the children of the forest, they sort of talk about the dire wolves and the unicorns and the great lions of the rock um, as the, sort of different than other animals and, and sort of in the group of the old races. Um, so that's as close as I can come. I don't think the dire wolves can like kill whites like dragon glass or withstand the blade of an other or anything like that. I just think they can probably sense them and you know, they they're hip to them. They understand the threat of it. Yeah. There's certainly the ghost certainly seems to be his sort of hackles go up when, when there are whites around and he seems to when magic's about to happen and things like that. He just seems very aware um, the only other sort of like slight asterisk I would put to what you were saying is that in line with my even doubt blame Blood Raven, I suspect that some of the instances where Ghost is doing clever things, finding stuff and all the rest of it, it may well be Blood Raven who has um, remotely walked into Ghost in order to find things. Um, like the cache of dragon glass, I think is the classic example, but I think there may well be other ones. Blood Raven using Ghost to um, uh, to show John things or to protect John or something like that. So it's it's a possibility, but um, yeah, I think that dire wolves do seem to be magically attuned, as it were. I think you know that I am here for your Lord Blood Raven tinfoil. <laughs> <laughs> 
sounds quite conspiratorial, but I'm here for it. Excellent. Well, it, it, it is. And uh, I do promise you guys the last video in my... Men, what is now take turning... this man to the dungeon. Have him hanged immediately. <laughs> the last I'm video in my you. epic length series on Robert's Rebellion, Tower of Joy, will be something which may or may not have the title, but certainly in my mind has the title of Ibn Doubt, Blame Blood Raven, looking at how he has manipulated events all through that period and uh well, I, 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 it's quite brave of you to try to expose the plans of lord bloodraven like that i mean that's that's you well, know it's basically making like CIA it. it's like making cia conspiracy videos on youtube it's like yeah go ahead put a target on yourself if you want to well you know some somebody's got to stand up to his evilness um I think we're coming towards an end now, uh, guys. We've got two or possibly three more questions from my patrons. So if you have got any more questions in the chat, now is the time to drop them in. Um, Torsten D asks from Patreon, um, I was re recently wondering if Bronn would play a role in the final books. As we know, the sh uh, in the show, his role was exaggerated a lot. Or is he sidelined for good? Um, I think the the short answer is that he probably uh, has got a much bigger role on the show than in the books. Um, certainly the whole thing with him, like shooting at dragons with huge um, scorpions and things like that, I think that's very much a show thing. Um, but I don't think his story is over in the books either. Um, I think that his um, social climbing will mean that he will get involved a little bit more. He's clearly trying to get uh, move up as high up the the sort of the social scale as he, as he possibly can. Whether that's actually you know, in terms of getting a castle or two castles, whatever it is, that he's clearly doing that. And the, with the events that are going on in or will be going on in the Winds of Winter, I think that we can definitely see him get, getting involved a bit more. But what what do you think, LML? Do you think in the books that Bronn will have much of a role? Uh, in the books, probably no. I, I think he is what he is. Um, I think they're finding a little more roles for him in the show just because the actor is really good and he's developed a relationship with some of the main characters. So it, it's probably pretty smart to continue to use that. Um, but I... I just think it's a diff that's probably a difference between book and show mostly. I do like the idea that all this scorpion foreshadowing might be leading to, you know, shooting down the ice dragon or something like that. Um, you know, would be quite the turn if the ice dragon manages to take down one of Danny's dragons and we're like, holy crap, only to be, you know, have somebody take it down with a spear or something or who knows. There's also, um, I want to shout out my friend Bron Steris who's just started a YouTube channel and uh, it doesn't have a tons of bells and whistles. It's just Bron Steris talking, uh, but he's a pretty smart guy and he has picked up on some foreshadowing in the show, which is his whole thing. He loves to pick up on show foreshadowing that Arya might be involved in shooting the Night's King or the ice dragon with an arrow. The very first scene we had with Arya was the one where Bran is shooting poorly, can't hit the target. And then Arya comes in, and hits a bullseye from right behind him. Uh, so he's speculating, and there's some other stuff building on that. So he's speculating that, you know, maybe Arya won't shoot the Night King, but maybe she'll be part of shooting down the uh, the Ice Dragon. Maybe Bran will help guide the arrow. So if you guys are interested in stuff like that and some other cool theories about the new season, then check out Bron Steri's YouTube channel. And it's spelled B R O N S T E R Y S. He's one of my dragon patrons, by the way. Excellent. I always like to uh, support new channels, so please, guys, do go and uh, check that out. And if, if one of the mods could uh, provide a link, that would be fantastic. Um, I think that's a show-only bit of foreshadowing. Uh, I think in the books yes. we don't see uh, I uh, um, uh, do any firing of bows up in Winterfell. But uh, but no, uh, nonetheless, that's a that's a really good catch. And I think that the um, the the idea of um, one of the dragons being shot down uh, by something in the eye. Um, there, there is so much foreshadowing for it through the books, uh, through in Fire and Blood and all the rest of it, that I think it makes a lot of sense to me that that is how one of the dragons is going to die. Um, it also makes sense to me, this idea of you know the, the two dragons killing each other. 
um, uh, in the way that we were describing earlier. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. But um, you, for them to have introduced, uh, firstly, the the fact that one of them gets shot down by a javelin uh, throw and then introduced this idea of the scorpion that could potentially kill dragons um, and then not have it kill dragons, it leaves open the possibility that surely King's Landing will be fitted with this, having bought themselves lots of time, will be fitted with an array of these scorpions, these huge um, sort of ballistas, uh, then uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that we will see dragons, or at least a dragon over King's Landing, being shot at by scorpions. Humble prediction. Um, uh, J-Star, thank you so much for the second super chat. Um, $10.00. This is a follow-up on the direwolves issue. Having said all that, why do you think the direwolves will be important then against the dead? Um, I think it's, well, it's a very good question. I think that there are a couple of things here. First of all, the, their importance is not necessarily against the dead so much as providing a link between the Starks. This is certainly in the books. This is something which is not, showed so much in the show, but in the books, then we're often seeing uh, one Stark sort of seeing through the eyes, uh, their own direwolf, then through the eyes of another direwolf to see what's going on elsewhere. There is almost this big link hack of the Stark children, which is personified by these direwolves. So their, their importance to the plot is not so much just about, uh, you know, attacking the dead or anything like that. There is this, their kind of magic-y sense, as it were, but their their importance is um, going to be in uh, linking the Starks and also specific things for specific Starks. So Ghost with John, uh, I think when he dies and he will go into Ghost, I think that the story of Aya and Nymeria is not over either. I think there's stuff going on there and obviously Nymeria dragged Lady Stoneheart out from the water. So there's a there's specific things going on there. Then their role is not there to be part of the fight against the dead, as it were. Their role is there linking in with the fate of the Starks. Is, is anything to add on to that, Alamel? No, and and in this that's I love that theory about the fate of the Starks thing. And um you know it's kind of been a little disappointing the, the show not using the wolves very much. So We'll probably only see a little bit of them in the last season. They're really good as personal guardians. They're also really good as truth tellers. Like, you know, if Rob had listened to his wolf, he might not have gone to the Red Wedding, for example. It's a there's a big scene made of it in the books. How the wolf does you know doesn't like the phrase, attacks one of the phrase, doesn't want to go across the bridge, makes a you know. I mean, it's over and over and over. So, you got to listen to your wolf when it tries to tell you something. So. That's kind of the way I see it. It's more of a personal connection to the character. Like you said, it's used to build the character. Um, now, we do see when John fights the white that Ghost helps him because the ghost is willing to put his life on the line and die before John does. So they, the wolves are potentially there. They could sacrifice themselves and buy a character a key moment to grab a new weapon or to escape or breach safety, that kind of thing. So I'm sure they'll be up in the mix. But, uh, you know, that's they don't have magical abilities to fight others or anything. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Benjamin Anderson, $10. Thank you so much. Uh, what can we draw from the parallels between the Children of the Forest with White Walkers and Pequininos uh, with uh, Father Trees, with Father Trees from Speaker of the Dead, Ender's Game series? Sorry for the loaded question, you guys rock. Well, thank you. Um, I have to admit, I'm not an Ender's Game expert, so I'm going to throw this over to LML. Do you know about this or in particular? It's been a few years, but I do remember it's there are these creatures that respawn inside of trees. Um, there's this weird little larva stage, and then they kind of turn into dwarves or elves or something. But they, when they're born, they're really tiny, and they start inside the tree and... It's cool. It's a very interesting sort of symbiotic humanoid tree relationship. Um, and it, it does seem like maybe George got a couple of ideas from it. They're pretty different than what's going on. And I would say that they're both riffing on the same tradition of like trees and elves and dryads and stuff. But 
Um, the Pequeninos are really interesting because it's more of a sci-fi setting. So you get more insight into like this weird sort of organical way, that, uh, organic way that it happens. Organical. That's not a word. <clears throat> so it's, it's pretty interesting. I, it's been a while since I've read it. So I'm not sure if the questioner has specific parallels in mind, but you definitely think when you think about the two, they're, they're fairly similar. Um, yeah. Okay. So as I say, I'm not an expert on that, but um, hopefully that and a sort of that that helps with that. I, I think that what we get with George R. R. Martin and a lot of these things, he draws inspiration from a lot of different places. But what I would always um, caution people on is to try and is when they uh, would try and say this is what he's trying to do. Therefore. This is going to happen because it happened in this other inspiration. He's drawing inspiration from things that does not mean that he's copying them. So, yes, there may well be hints and links to other things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's exactly the same. In fact, in most instances, it's not exactly the same. Uh, Mike uh, Kinch, uh, thank you so much. $10. That's very kind. Hi, guys. What are your thoughts about the possibility that scorpion darts may have been dipped in the long farewell poison? in season seven there's some subtle evidence in the show that supports this so the long farewell uh poison for those who are unaware this um this is something we i think cersei and um kyburn discuss it this is something that kyburn has got he's quite big on the poisons um and this is something that i think that they said that we're going to be using on ilaria or Possibly one of the other sands, I can't remember. Uh, underneath the uh, which which one of the sands was it that um, survived on the show? Uh, I don't remember. I have no idea what. I think, but I think the idea. Are. Yeah, I think the idea was that that uh, Tyene or whichever one it was um, was given this, and they would die a long, painful death, and Alaria had to watch it. And this was called the long farewell. That poison. Um, so. Uh, the the hints that that uh, scorpion darts may have been dipped in that well that's entirely possible poisons there's a lot of talk about poisons in Game of Thrones which it has to be said it's always um, with the obvious exception of the the purple wedding and Joffrey um, it's always slightly hidden, never 100% clear what's being used where and when. There are hints that perhaps there was poison being used on Tywin, but it's never made 100% clear. There are lots of other little hints about things going on, and that's the way of um, uh, poisons, is that they are um, a, a hidden way of killing people. My it, instinct, though, on this is that uh, a poison which kills humans is not necessarily a poison which would kill dragons. And in very practical terms, LML was mocking me for my practicality earlier on in this live stream, but in very practical terms, the only way for a, uh, a bolt from a scorpion to actually damage uh, a dragon is through the eye. All the other bits have got armor plating on it would just ping off. That's not a problem. And if they get a scorpion bolt in the eye, then they're going to die anyway. So I don't think that there's actually much point in poisoning those things. Uh, that's just my gut reaction. But may maybe I've maybe I've missed something. Um, you have, have you got anything to add to that? No, I don't. Uh, but there is one other super chat that I like here. Uh, Cade Norm nine ninety nine says, and yeah, I, I, I just you said it perfectly. I don't have anything to add. So. Um, I don't mean to be brusque moving on, but see the hound saw the airhead mountain in the flames, but the trip north only seemed to help the Night King. Was the vision just a plot device or will it trip? Will the trip north end up playing some other role? So, for example, he's saying, you know, will it turn out that we need there to have been an ice dragon in order to, you know, win at the end or something? That's a good question. Um, I'm always I'm curious to see how how tight that is. You know, sometimes there are those kind of plot holes. Some people think maybe maybe it's Night King sending visions in the flames when we think it's R'hllor. I think Grey Area might have a theory about that um, because it did sort of work like a trap. And Night King did seem like sort of ready, knew what to do, you know, specifically took down the dragon so it fell in the lake. And I buy that as, as a hypothesis. So 
we'll have to see. But I, I love the question asking, like, where does a vision come from? Who's sending it? What's the motive there? What do you think about that, Robert? Um, well, my take on it is that I think it's slightly more likely that this was a it was a real vision in the flames in the same way that um, Melisandre gets real visions in the flames. Uh, but it would not surprise me if the Night King saw this in some way. He certainly seems to be able to get into Bran's kind of astral plane, as it were. And yep. uh, there's no reason to think that, therefore, he wouldn't be able to get into other ones like that. So I agree. It certainly seemed the way they set it up on the show, um, it wasn't the best structured episode, but the way they set it up in the show certainly seems to imply that the Night King was sitting there waiting to trap them and was wanting the dragons to be there and had brought the very weapons that were needed in order to take down a dragon or two. That could be that he set the whole thing up or he saw it and then set it up. So there are a couple of different possibilities. I tend more towards the latter rather than him doing magic in the flames because the way that it seems to be was that you would get it, Thoros seems to create the magic, create the vision, and then called Sandor over to come and see it. So it seems to be him doing the magic and I think somebody seeing that from the outside uh, go, okay, so that's where they're going. Is that chime with you? Yeah, I, I actually like that idea the best, I think, that um, the vision simply exists and different people can potentially tune into it. So it's more like Night's King is eavesdropping on the vision that Sandor is having and maybe sort of twisting it to his advantage. Because I do think that uh, that guy, uh, who we affectionately call Todrick Stark, uh, Night King before he was you know tied to the tree and transformed, I suspect that he should be a Green Seer character. For yeah. many reasons. That was a Weirwood tree, and Night King seems to be able to visit Bran on the Weirwood astral plane. That all is easily explained by his being a Green Seer. So if he's a Green Seer, he's an 8,000 year old Green Seer. He's probably pretty good, pretty talented, you know. His his form is like very tightly honed, his jump shot, you know. It's pretty much like Steph Curry at this point. It's it's on lockdown. So I think Night King um is is going to be a skilled user of the weirwood net i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah i i agree completely i i think that he almost certainly was a um a green seer and i think that this is the um the way that he has got these kind of um mirror or ice versions of green seer powers um because he was initially one and then he got turned into another uh, a white walker um Infamous uh, 1503, $10, thank you so much. Uh, when I is in the dungeon in the Game of Thrones, uh, she describes sensing something dark that loves her not being there. She also describes a dream similar to John's dream of the crypts, your thoughts. Uh, P.S. You two are the shit. There you go. Uh, I know people love it when I say rude words. Um, uh, so uh, I got something they, on this if you want. Oh, go! I was, I was going to waffle for a while, but I'm happy to have you go first. I heard the sound waffle. of waffles being fried in your mouth. That's what <laughs> I heard. Um, so it's a, there is a lot of comparisons, strong comparisons between the Dragon Skull Dungeon of King, of the Red Keep, which Arya goes to twice, and the Crypts of Winterfell. There's a spiral stairs. There's a lot of the same language the eyes seeming to move, either whether of the dragon skulls or the kings of winter. Um, there's just a ton of similar symbolism going on. And Arya even thinks of the crypts of Winterfell while she's in the red, uh, the dragon skull dungeon under the Red Keep. So I think a lot of the points of that is that there is a dragon secret deep in the crypts of Winterfell. And that is essentially Jon Snow's heritage, whether that's an actual dragon egg or just the idea of Jon Snow as a hidden dragon and his, the secret of his identity is deep in the crypts or something like that. Or it could even go back to the origins of House Stark having something to do with Azor High and the dragons that may have been involved in the first time around. So there's a lot of cool comparisons. If you want to have fun with that, just read 
the, the first couple descriptions of the crypts, particularly the one where Robert and Ned go into the crypts and then read Arya's two scenes under the red keep and you'll you'll see a lot of common points so i'll just i'll keep it brief but it's cool parallel yeah and the uh, this is a complete digression but i i actually looked at that scene before and compared it with Tyrion when remembering when he goes down to see the, the dragon skulls underneath the red keep and the difference between the two of them is astonishing in feel oh yeah it's um I'm going to read a little bit uh, here. Uh, she ran her fingers down a tooth, black and sharp, a dagger made of darkness. It made her shiver. Um, it's just a skull. It can't hurt me. Yet somehow the monster seemed to know she was there. Um, uh, uh, then another skull loomed ahead, the biggest monster of all, but Aya did not even slow. She leapt over the ridge of black teeth as tall as swords, dashed through hungry jaws, and threw herself against the door. Um, for an instant, she could feel its teeth digging into her shoulder as if it wanted a bite of her flesh. It's the language here is the dragons are trying to attack her. Um, it's, it's incredibly uh, sort of uh, emotive language. And then if you compare that to um, uh, when Tyrion goes there, um, it's, uh, it's the, the, the language is almost playful. Um, it's talking about um, casting shadows which leap and dance on the wall behind him. Um, the, the, the teeth were long, curving knives of black diamond. The flame of the torch was nothing to them. And it was just like um, the, the language is so different between the two of them. And you feel free to sort of tinfoil away about why those two have such very different experiences. But um, yeah, that was a complete digression. Um, uh, the, the, the point here, I think, is that uh, Aya being in the, um, with the dragon skulls, the dragons did not like or want her presence there. Um, and that is crucial for anyone who thinks that she is going to be riding a dragon. She is not. She is an ice character, not a fire character. Um, Okay, I think I'm going to uh, round up with a final question from um, Patreon. This is Ellen King, um, and it's quite a, quite a good one to end up with. Uh, this is saying a kind of a broad learning question. How do you approach the books so you master them so well? As a reader who really wants to go deeper, has read multiple times and follows content creators, what steps would you suggest a reader take next to help them go deeper? Is it helpful to have a copy of each book um, just to mark up? What about reading each each character through? So just reading the ch chapters by a particular character. Um, so this is a question of how to study the books to get the most out of it. Um, LML, do you want to just give us your method for studying A Song of Ice and Fire at kind of a high level? What would, what would you recommend is the, the way to get into it? Well, I mean, all the things that <clears throat> Ellen named are good. Doing character rereads is interesting. If you want to really get into a character, you see a lot of things that you don't see otherwise, which is why I think Girls Gone Canon's format is really interesting, where they take a character and read through all their chapters and then switch characters. Um, that's cool. But for me, I, I listened to them on audiobooks a lot when I was you know, I don't do it as much anymore, but when I was first writing and starting off, I listened to the audiobooks all the time because just in the background was I was doing stuff because I'm always looking for key phrases and parallels and stuff. And they just sort of jump out at you when you listen. So, I mean, you're not going to catch those things if you're not listening to it. And nobody really has time to sit there and read the books all day. So audiobooks is really a key element of it. I use a search of ice and fire a lot. Once I pick up on a phrase like, waves of blood and darkness or blood and night black and blood i'll start searching those phrases or like old ones for example uh I, you know search old ones yeah girls gone can oh, ellen's asking girls gone canon is a podcast uh highly recommended it's got chloe and uh eliana and they both have done a lot of good work in the fandom on their own and then they united it's two very smart women so it's if you want a little bit of that uh feminine wisdom you'll definitely find it there and they are brilliant all the way around so definitely girls gone can check them out uh but um where was i 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so how do we, how do we, so the main thing I want to say is that Song of Ice and Fire is a lot going on and you have to sort of study the thing that calls to you the most. Like for me, I'm into ancient mythology and I love stuff about the stars and comets and stuff like that. So the first connection I made was the idea that a moon cracking open to birth dragons was talking about meteors coming from a moon that suffered some calamity. And so I'm good at researching that kind of stuff. But if I were to try to do kind of research that let's say Girls Gone Canon or Crow Food's Daughter or somebody else does, it might not be as good. If I tried to do a traveler's guide to Westeros, it wouldn't be half as good as what In Deep Geek does because that's not what I'm on fire about. So you got it like Shakespeare of Thrones is a great example. She loves Shakespeare and there's a lot of Shakespeare in A Song of Ice and Fire. So she does great work by diagramming all the Shakespeare. So that's kind of the whole thing is just follow whatever that you are most fired up about. That's where you're most likely to have insights and breakthroughs and you're the most likely to make connections that are exciting. And that excitement, and do you tell me if you agree with this, Robert, that thrill of discovery um, and figuring out what George is saying in between the lines, it, that spurs you on to keep writing and to edit your audio and and to do the whole thing. I mean, that's the thrill of it. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that the um, for me, my approach to these things is uh, read it through from end to end a couple of times, three times, whatever it takes to understand the overall theme of where it's going, what's happening with things and all the rest of it. You don't need all the detail um, to start with. And then what I do is I ask questions. I It's not a forced thing for me. It's just stuff that comes up when I'm just talking to people or things that, that happen. Questions lodge in my mind um, that I just want to find the answers to. And some of these are like the big obvious questions that everyone has. What actually happened at the Tower of Joy? Um, and then when I dig down inside these, I then find that I start to uncover and I think understand certain things, but other questions come up. So um, in the realm of my normal spoiling my videos, uh, the, the question that I'm currently now um, looking into is because I think it's absolutely crucial to understanding what happened at the Tower of Joy, I, I'm starting to come to this opinion, is why didn't Ned take the bones of the other uh, if it's Bannerman North or get somebody else to go up north. That for me is the thing which is a currently really standing out. It just it, it's so out of character and it was unnecessary. You could have sent someone back. And uh, so so for me, I ask a question, I think I get towards something, but then it leads to another question, and then it leads to another question. And then I just go through when I search through the books. Um, uh, and I see what I can find, and I am a huge believer that I am not the font of all knowledge and wisdom on this. There are people who have been studying this for way longer than I have. There are people who have been studying this in different ways than I do, um, and that is one of the reasons why I get people onto this channel like LML who approaches things from a slightly different angle, because I think that um, you watching this value the fact that there are that there is so much wisdom out here in this community and understanding of it that it's it's getting the different perspectives is what actually helps you get the much more rounded approach to these things. So I say this so, so often with RML is that I suspect that we probably agree on like 99% of all of the main stuff, but we come at it from very different angles. Um, and But it's the fact that we can then complement each other's understanding of it with, with uh, I, I can as I quite often do, ask about what's the symbol, is there symbolism to back up this? I've got my theory as I was doing earlier in the stream. I've got my theory about Dunk being uh, some sort of catalyst, some sort of magically important person without being a magical person himself. Is there any kind of symbolism? And then LML can come and say, well, yes, there are these things here and that can add to the whole. So I'm a big believer in don't just do it all yourself. Find out what other clever people have been doing as well, um, if that makes sense.
Um, we did have, uh, while we're doing that, we had another super chat from Go Kings Go 2013, $20. Thank you. That's very kind. Saying, don't have any questions, just love your live streams. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and uh, Maura Lee. Oh, hi, Maura. Uh, you, uh, I thought you weren't going to be able to make it today, but thank you. That's very kind. Uh, uh, $20 just at the end there. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, all of your support, not just for me, but for the whole of the community. Uh, Maura, you are an absolute star. Um, uh, did, you know, uh, real quick, there's one question yeah. here in the, in the chat that I can answer super fast that I like. Uh, uh, Joe Moradito says, so if the show got John's heritage right, is he the only Targaryen with black hair? Uh, I found that very weird. What's your opinion? So actually in Fire and Blood, we've actually been shown that the Targaryen looks are seem to be recessive. And when they marry somebody with uh, strong genes, like House Strong or House Baratheon or House Stark, that the dark looks will generally dominate. Um, I think George's, I mean, obviously George's genetics is not, quite scientific real genetics but in the very simple sense the very first mystery in the story was how the lannister blonde always yields before the baratheon black hair and it's similar for targaryen so that's why john can be disguised the cool part is that i think there's foreshadowing that john will end up like elric of melnibony another fantasy hero from michael moorcock's fantasy series and that in the process of dying and being resurrected he'll end up with white hair and uh, Targaryens do sometimes have the sort of platinum white hair. So he'll look a lot more like a Targaryen if he gets white hair. Um, and so I'm, I'm rooting for that. Red eyes, white hair. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm pulling for. He'll look like his wolf because he'll be merged with his wolf in a sense. So um, yeah. last thing, Robert, before I go, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask your opinion. Uh, you know, it was my birthday a week ago. <clears throat> and uh, I, I've got, I did not know that. Yeah. And so I've got Happy one birthday. pair of Targaryen. I've got one pair of Game of Thrones shoes coming at me. So these are the House Targaryen shoes here. You can see that that's really nice sort of flame stitching going on, uh, black soles, which I like. But then there's also these, uh, the White Walker shoes, which are, are pretty good looking too. So when you look at these, you, you can see they got this really nice uh, sort of ice blue threads here. And then I got the black stripes for like the dragon glass inside the Night's King. It says winter is here and it even has um it's even got the little spiral the white walker spiral on the inside of the sole i don't know if i can find the right picture here but what do you think white walkers or or, or house targaryen well i i feel humbled that uh, that the great and stylish lml should be asking me for any kind of styling advice um i've i've always thought you uh, a lot more of an ice man, I have to say. That's just that's. Just, I think I think that would go go well with you with the the kind of um, uh, monochrome look. Uh, yeah, you can uh, you can carry that one off quite well, I would have thought. But that, that's up to you. I, I I personally never would buy white trainers simply because I would just get them mucky on day one. Well, that's why I like the black sold ones on the targs. Those are nice to keep clean. And by the way, those Adidas Ultra Boost. Those are like the most comfortable shoes ever made. Just so you know, they're they're friggin' awesome. I got a couple pairs. <laughs> Maura Lee, thank you so much. Uh, Twenty dollars uh, saying for LML. Uh, he is an excellent guest, uh, and I'm delighted every time he agrees to come on. Um, in fact, this time he kind of punted his business uh, at me when he. I, th I think he hangs around to see whether or not I haven't got any guests on my live stream, and then just slips into my DMs and says, "Hey, so who have you got?" That wow, that sounds. That sounds pretty fucking greasy there. <laughs> well, that's, that's how it comes across, mate. Uh, it's, it's a, a little, delight a though, every single time. Um, okay, guys, uh, now I've I've insulted LML. I will ask him to big himself up. LML, what is your <laughs> channel? Why should people go over there and visit you? Uh, well, I think I've I think I gave a pretty good plug earlier. I don't want to go on too long, but yeah, you know, symbolism, mythology. Like I said, if you want to start at the beginning and see what it's all about. Just go to either LuciferMeansLightbringer.com or Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel. The video pinned right at the top is me talking from Con of Thrones last year. It's like 45 minutes. It's my basic spiel. If you don't find that interesting, then forget we ever met. Uh, but if you <laughs> if you like it, then you can go on through the podcast in order and check it out and then start joining us Myth Heads on Starry Wisdom Sunday. We always gather on my YouTube channel at 3 Eastern and uh, we'll be covering the show this year, like I said on that channel as well. 
And uh, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, I'm just going to pick up on one uh, comment I see here that I particularly like. Uh, Felicia uh, Ilana, LML looks like a grown up version of Mr. Tumnus. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I would agree with that. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, in terms of stuff coming up on my channel, I've mentioned it all already, uh, but please do uh, keep an eye out for my season eight videos that I've got coming up. These aren't just standard uh, what I predict is going to happen in season eight, but trying to look at the character arcs of, of, of uh, different characters like Sansa. What is it that her character arc so far tells us about what should be happening? to her in the last season and uh, obviously at the end of the books as well. Uh, guys, if you are at all interested in supporting this channel um, uh, or getting access to some uh, exclusive stuff I do for my patrons, please do check out my Patreon page. There's a link down in the description or go to patreon.com slash indeepgeek. LML, thank you so much for coming on. It is always um, an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, thank you uh, once again. And guys, I will be back next week, same, uh, same time. Um, or it might be slightly different for European people, uh, I, depending on when the clocks change there. Um, the American and, and uh, European clock uh, summertime changes are different uh, at the moment. It's very confusing. But anyway, guys, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you particularly for the questions, some fantastic questions coming through. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you, LML. Guys, I shall see you again next week. Take care.